Okay, I'm going to dispense with the roll, but I'm going to note that all members of the um, local government subcommittee are present. And so first item on the agenda is we've got Jen Hensley here. She's going to provide us with um, some information on local option sales tax. So we'll turn it over to you, Jen. So you'll need yeah, you're morning, unmuted. Everyone. Uh, yeah. morning, everyone. I uh, am pleased to be here this morning. I will dive right in. Um, for the last uh, about year and a half or so, um, I've been working with the County of Missoula who uh, wanted to pull together a coalition of folks talking about how we can more readily ease property tax for residents by capturing some of the dollars that we believe are being left on the table by our visitors, the tourist industry. Um, and recognizing that we have visitors not only from Montana, but also outside of our borders and uh, that we live here too. So trying to figure out how to shield locals in a way that is uh, constitutionally allowed, but also a creative way to make sure that they can get access to things that are parts of their daily life and necessary to live here while not being unduly taxed. Um, and so we reached out to commissioners and city council people, Main Street Business Associations, statewide associations, industry organizations, and uh, asked what they thought about different elements of our idea. Uh, we convened uh, a few different working tables to let folks talk face to face and we listened and listened and listened and some themes kept bubbling to the top and they're not dissimilar from what you all heard on the very first day of the governor's uh, task force meeting that they find the system to be exceedingly complex and when they look at things to simplify they understand why that complexity exists right over the years different entities have um, lobbied successfully to either carve themselves out or create special provisions. And those were good arguments at the time and folks agreed with them. We heard over and over and over again that um, a one size fits all solution across the entire state wouldn't work unless there were levers built in to allow local communities and local governments some flexibility to reflect uh, you know, their own community personality. We all know that the needs of Great Falls and how their uh, residents want to develop their communities look different than the needs of Gallatin County with some of the fastest growing communities in the nation there. So uh, we wanted to allow some uniformity as to decrease the frustration at the legislative level um, while also letting them be flexible on the ground. We think we have found uh, a pretty good proposal. It doesn't make everybody thrilled and it doesn't make everybody angry. And I've heard that that's, that's usually a good sign. So with permission, I'd love to go ahead and share my screen and uh, start the presentation. Let's see if this is gonna work for us. Uh, let me know. It's looking good. Quick. Yeah, you can see that? Yes, ma'am. We're off to a great start then. Okay. Uh, property tax relief by capitalizing on our tourism industry. And I know that um, folks here in Montana have done an amazing job capitalizing on the allure of our incredible state and the desire for people to want to come and visit. And we want to just expand on that good work. Uh, so diving right in. You all know the problem. We have discussed it over and She's over. Got it. She's got it. You're good. Am you I just, there is a screen. I'm sorry. Sorry. Was I unmuted? <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> Go ahead, Jan. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I just making sure that you all were there with me still. Okay. As you all know, our economy has shifted away from our traditionally extractive industries. When I was uh, you know, tiny growing up in Montana, um, we relied on uh, that the mining, timber, 
oil and gas industries to keep us afloat. And they did robustly. We are the treasure state for a reason. And that's shifted for a lot of different reasons. I still believe we have a robust, resilient and diverse economy. And tourism is a prominent piece of that economy that's yet to be fully monetized. Because of this shift, our tax paying landscape looks different. We've reduced the number of large corporate property taxpayers and we still have to provide services at the local level through property taxes. So residential taxpayers are picking up more and more of that dime. Now there's more of them, right? And the stresses on our local communities are more and more as well. So we all have seen this one, I think. One resident in Montana provides these services at the local level. Now these are services that are paid for by your property taxes, police, fire, public safety, water, sewer, roads, bridges, public health, garbage, maintenance. And we support that for 13 tourists. I'm gonna to put a little asterisk here when I say 13 tourists, I'm pulling the number from the Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research. Their number is 12.5 million. It looked prettier on my slide to say 13, so that's 13. So understand that that is the number we're talking about. It's not different sources. So 13 tourists we support for every single resident. As the decades pass, we can anticipate that our population will grow, maybe even double, as much as that freaks me out. Tourism will also slowly rise. It has leveled out somewhat, but I cannot imagine that tourism won't slowly inch up over the years and services will continue to be taxed at the local level. Uh, as I said, Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research brings these numbers and just this week, they revealed their most uh, recent study. Uh, and I really suggest you check it out. This is the official source here. It's got, it's chock full of incredible information, but spending categories for out of state visitors were impressive. Out of state visitors, 1.4 billion in food and beverage, 1.1 billion in lodging, shopping, 600 million, outfitters and guides, 500 million. There's a reason they come to this state. They like to drop cash. They like to drive through. They like to see what we've got. Um, let's ask them to help pitch in for some of our roads and bridges. So we have one elegant solution and it's rolled out in three different parts. First, we ask our visitors to help pay for their impact on our communities. We shield our residents from increased tax burdens. You're going to see at several points throughout this policy, um, different ways we've built that in and that comes from best practices gleaned from other communities and other states and really good creative ideas from the folks around the table. And finally, we're gonna funnel that new revenue directly to local property tax relief and areas of high need, um, areas of impact. So I wanna think of these as impact fees in the areas that tourists use most, okay? Um, Montana agrees with us. In December of 22, we put some questions out in the field. It was a robust poll. A lot of different topics on it, but a, the big topic was taxes. We asked folks if they would support taxing commerce tourist transactions at 4% if that money went to reduce property taxes for residents of that county or city. So you know how polls work commonly. There's a question and then you sort of educate through and ask questions throughout. And then the very, ask, very last question, you circle back to the first. Now, after everything I've told you, and we added details like what if we only tax tourist focus activities? What if the money went to reduce your property taxes, et cetera? This are the, these are the results. See this dark blue line, 64% right out of the gate supported common tourist transactions being taxed. After all the education, 70% increased and they were informed and they supported. I think that's a remarkable number and if you talk to any campaign wonk, they'll know, they'll tell you that they're, they'd are they be willing to put anything on the ballot that got those sorts of numbers on an early poll. The total oppose decreased somewhat. And I think also interesting, this strongly opposed stayed level. Now these are folks for whom nothing is going to change their mind, right? They're not gonna support this regardless. Now, why they don't support it, we didn't ask that question. Right, We didn't keep them on the phone long enough to see if they just opposed it because they oppose all sales tax 
or if they opposed it because they don't like local option and they want a general statewide, we're not really sure where that opposition comes from. We do know that a poll a year later that was conducted that asked where folks stood on a general statewide sales tax gave about 65% opposing it right out of the gate. So we can guess where some of that opposition comes from. One thing's for certain though, they like this idea. Common tourist transactions at a local level if that money is used to reduce property taxes for residents. So we have a tax relief through tourism proposal. First, county commissioners and the city council or the city council place issue on the general election ballot. We're gonna get into the meat of that because I know that Senator Hertz specifically has a lot of questions about what that election would look like. And we have listened and we tried to in, inform and incorporate details that are going to satisfy that itch. This is our first big shield for our locals. We're gonna tax tourist focused sales. Now I, as a resident of Montana and a resident of Lewis and Clark County and a resident of Helena, I go out to eat in restaurants in Helena. So I would pay an assessment on that. However, I also know that this is not a necessity of my everyday life. And I can support my family and live my life without going there. So I can make my stuff at home. Is it as good as the cheeseburger down at the Old Salt? No, but it's assistance. It's uh, sustenance, right? So three, 10% of those revenue funds would fund rural infrastructure. Larger urban counties are not single islands in Montana. Our rural counties across Montana also support tourism. They're just not hit as hard as some of these more urban communities. We recognize and value the fact that our rural counties are impacted by the increased number of visitors and they should benefit from a part of the revenue collected from them. Our idea is to put this money into a special revenue account, distribute the money in accordance similar to BARSA, uh, the tax calculation currently in use, put in the use it or use it, use it or lose it provision, and, um, and let's let some of those uh, smaller populated counties go to work with this money. They don't need $60 million for infrastructure money, but you know what they do need? They need like a million or 2 million to pull down some federal matching funds so they can replace their water systems. That's what we're hearing from the infrastructure team. And the remaining 90% goes to reduce property tax and support high needs area. Okay, so supporting high needs area is, is the sweet spot in there. Um, Senator Hurst is going to be glad to know that we don't think that we should be purchasing large swaths of green space with this revenue. However, there are some needs that local communities have, say, in Belgrade, that perhaps that need doesn't exist in Great Falls. And we want to reflect that local officials know best how to properly use that money. Everybody wants to know what the numbers are. What could this mean? What could this look like? So I'm going to give you a little teaser. What this could mean in one of the scenarios is that for a $500,000 home with a 4% tax assessment on all the available categories, in each of these counties, this would be the percent of their county tax only reduction. So if only the counties put this out, Flathead County, their county portion of their property tax bill would drop 85%. Gallatin, that would drop 90%. To me, that's significant. That's real money. So let's get into exactly how we plan on doing this. General provisions. First, as we said, the uh, questions placed on the ballot. So what I've done is started at the 30,000 foot level. You all know that as you zoom in, this real sausage making begins. And so here are our details. Questions on the ballot, board of directors oversees that tax collection and expenditure, very similar to how resort communities do it today. And a required annual reporting to the Montana legislature, you would tell us what metrics you wanna see, revenue being uh, raised, which categories being taxed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever metrics you wanna see annually, you're gonna get it. That question on the ballot is gonna be put on an even number year of a general election. It's going to require at least a 40% voter ballot return slash turnout to pass 
We know there have been some conversations about what is turnout, what is ballot return. These are returned completed ballots. 40% um, voter turnout to pass. 50% plus one to win, right? Simple majority to win, but you gotta get that voter turnout. We want folks' voices to be heard. The categories of taxation and the tax rate shall be outlined on the voter ballot. Folks want to know what they're voting on. And the proposal must have a sunset reauth of 10 years. Now, just this morning, I was rethinking all of this and I'm like, well, a lot of these resort communities use this guaranteed revenue to issue bonds and wouldn't local communities wanna do that as well? I'm looking at that 10 years, is it gonna be long enough? I'm not sure. I know that there's some experts in Montana with an opinion on this though, and I'm sure you're gonna hear from them. The board of directors that oversees the tax collection and expenditure must consist of these four categories, at least three local citizens at large, at least one city, county or county elected official, a mayor or a chief exec or their appointee, and at least one local legislator. Now the local governing body can choose to create a local board of directors of 11 and make sure that there is a business owner on there and a banker and a butcher and a candlestick maker. They get to control what their board of directors look like as soon as these conditions are satisfied. They're going to establish bylaws and this board of directors is going to make recommendations to the local governing body regarding 40% of the revenue allocation. We're gonna to get to that detail in a couple of slides. The categories that could be eligible for taxation at the local level, I want you to think of this as a menu. Sometimes you like to order everything on off the menu like I like to do with appetizers for a large group. Sometimes you like to pick and choose. So this is our menu of items that could be taxed. Purchases at restaurants and retail drinking establishments, outfitter and guide services, rental cars, lodging facilities. We're gonna chat a little bit about that later. Airport landings and non-SNAP grocery items with the exception of the following. I was trying to find a system that was already built in that, that retailers could look at and apply layover with ease that they're already applying and laying over and that's SNAP, okay? If we have non-SNAP grocery items, they will be taxed. We're thinking like licorice and monster energy drinks. I also wanted to leave out activities or at items that folks needed to live their lives, regardless of whether they're a tourist or not. Pet food, soap, paper products, cleaning supplies, hygiene, and medicine, of course. We don't want to hit folks shopping for school supplies. Certainly don't want to tax uh, me when I go to pick up some children's Tylenol when my kiddo pops a fever. However, um, other things can be taxed and I can live without them. This is another one of those shields for locals, low-income elderly residents. The lodging facilities, I had a long conversation with representatives of the, um, the, the hotel and uh, hospitality industry. Um, as you know, currently those categories collect 8% total, four of it is facilities use and four is lodging bed tax. Uh, currently, 75% of the lodging bed tax is going to the general fund. 1% is building the historical society. In January, 2025, that 1% has ready homes waiting for that money. So this proposal is that 75% of the lodging bed tax that's currently going to the general fund is diverted and goes to the local economy. Think of it as you cutting taxes to the state and we can increase them at the local level if they choose. The markup on the lodging facilities remains 8% to the consumer. So our partners in the tourism industry, lodging and hospitality industry are already doing a big lift, putting 8% on top of their prices. And we think there's room in our general fund given the last couple of sessions to divert that 75% into direct property tax reduction. Jan, um, I just want to um, make a correction on your comment about SNAP. Um, yes. Licorice is SNAP, SNAP eligible as are most, uh, all other candy um, energy drinks are so a SNAP eligible, um, as is soda, chips, et cetera. So just wanted to make that clear. Thank you for clarifying that. That's interesting to me. So are we thinking maybe hot prepared foods or non-SNAP grocery items like a deli chicken? 
Correct. Anything hot, um, deli chicken hot is not eligible. Although if it's cooled off and it's sold the next day, it is eligible. But um, the resort tax does apply to snack type grocery items that are available under SNAP, but they, they have a separate list that they choose from for resort tax communities. Great, excellent information. This is, the, this is how we anticipate that this proposal is going to be adjusted and refined and corrected by you all. Um, so thank you for that. This is one of our local government levers that they're able to pull. The local governing body may choose which of those categories to tax and the rate of tax for each category. You got to cap it at 4% for any one category though. You can't, you can't tax rental cars at 7%. That's not okay. Got to cap it at 4%. Some communities may choose to only tax airport landings. Some communities may only choose to tax purchases at restaurants and retail drinking establishments, only tax outfitter and guide services. And that is their uh, prerogative. They're able to do that calculation for themselves. The local governing body may choose up to three days per year upon which no sales tax will be collected. Uh, this is a sales tax holiday. So this isn't one that everybody, anybody's really, this is no hill for anyone to die on. However, it is another way to shield locals. Say, if you, if you want to go out and purchase these big ticket items that are normally taxed, do it on one of these three days that the local government establishes as a sales tax holiday. Allocation, this is where the money goes. At least 50% of our revenue is gonna go directly to property tax reduction for residential properties that are primary residents and long-term rental properties. A local government may place additional restrictions. So they wanna guarantee that those, those uh, provisions are being passed on to renters. Maybe they'll ask a landlord to self-attest that they're providing a 60% rent reduction so they qualify for the property tax reduction. That's up to local governments to decide. Um, and I've had the conversation, of course, with Senator Hertz, and I'm sure all of you have as well about the difficulty in matching up maybe income verification with a property tax reduction. Those are details I think that local governments are really capable of making. They know their own communities, they know what databases are available to them, and therefore they can be responsible for that administration. 9.75 of that revenue would go to a special revenue fund to be allocated. We have already talked about this rural infrastructure. And a quarter of a percent, we want to recognize that our retailers collecting this dollar is they're not doing this automatically, They're, they might have to spend some more money on accountants, uh, hire a bookkeeper, you know, quarter time to make sure these pennies are counted. We want to uh, give them a quarter of a percent for administrative offset. And then the 40%. <clears throat> so a local government could choose to funnel all of that 40% into direct property tax reduction, making a 90% uh, revenue available for property tax reduction directly. They could also choose to spend it on public health and safety. Maybe you live in a community where your sheriff's office is taxed to the hilt by tourists getting lost in somebody's field. Maybe you need to maybe you need to funnel it there. Capital investment and maintenance of roads, bridges, sewer systems, water systems, other infrastructure and capital assets for the assessed area and housing. Again, Local governments know where their pain points are, what their local needs are, and which areas are being stressed because of the increased numbers of visitors. You all know that housing is stressed because of the increased number of visitors, and we think that's an appropriate place to maybe funnel some of this revenue as well. Easy, simple pie chart. We heard over and over and over, it needs to be simple. It doesn't get much simpler than this. Four colors. Here's our fine print. This may not be laid over the top of a local option resort area tax. So our intent is for resort communities to be able to continue as they exist today if that is their choice. If they choose to go with this one, that of course is their choice, but we're not, uh, we don't wanna mess with what's working for those resort area communities and everything that we've seen and heard says that they like what they've got. 
in the event that a general statewide sales tax is implemented, areas with this local option tax may lay their local tax on top of the general statewide sales tax. So this is, this is what we think may work. One of the largest arguments against a local option sales tax, and I think it's a real argument and should not be diminished or uh, overstepped, is that it, folks say a, net, a general statewide sales tax will never pass if we've got this. That may or may not be true. However, if it does, let's figure out what's gonna happen to this one. So if the statewide general sales tax is implemented, uh, an area who has previously passed this assessment can choose to keep their local assessment, but it's gotta be under 2%, 2% or under. That means that if a general statewide sales tax of 2% is passed and Park County wanted to keep their local and they wanted to drop theirs down to 1%, Park County could continue to collect 3% on items, 2% of that would go to the state, 1% of that would stay local. The benefit of this is that if a general statewide sales tax is implemented, as you all know, that's the magic trigger to collect on e-commerce. So we're gonna be collecting from the retailers like Amazon and Wayfair, those that really do hurt our main street businesses. They hurt our mom and pop businesses. This is a reason, one of the reasons why we didn't include straight retail in this proposal, because we don't wanna give folks another reason not to shop locally. The local option revenue within the locally assessed areas would con continue to be allocated to the local government. Those stressors wouldn't go away. Those local governments still need the ability to make decisions about that. Those dollars, they just need that flexibility. Okay, remember this graph? Now you know the policy behind how we could get there. Let's look at the numbers. We collected data from these four industries, lodging, restaurant, bar, outfitters, and guys in auto rentals. The sources vary for each because oddly, there's not one single place where we can get um, really specific numbers, or at least I couldn't get it in the amount of time that, that we had to work with. So I'll explain where we got these numbers. Lodging, I pulled straight from um, the House Bill 2 revenue estimate and uh, the 2022 actual 4% lodging tax number. I multiplied it by 75%. And this is the number that you would get if all of the lodging facilities were per capita distributed in these counties. So if Missoula had 10% of the population, they get 10% of the pie, et cetera. Restaurant and bar, we pulled from the National Restaurant Association's uh, estimate that two point, um, I'm sorry, something, oh, the original number I'll put up, I'll pull up, I'll get to it later, but we did the same sort of thing. We evenly distributed per capita, the, the large number they have for Montana revenue from restaurants and bars and put it into each can, county as their population dictated. Outfitters and guys was a more difficult number for us to get. So in 2018, the industry put out a study estimating that uh, one number was the revenue for um, uh, statewide 40 million. We, if you'll remember, the Institute for Tourism and Recreational Research had 500 million for out-of-state visitors. So we think that this is an exceedingly conservative number here for outfitters and guides. Um, but again, we wanted to stay with what, with what the industry agreed with. And in 2018, they believed that these numbers were where it was at. Auto rentals were pulled from Department of Commerce's uh, reports on where on how much revenue was raised from um, the existing auto rental tax. So we took these total spend and we created three different models. If we taxed everything at 2% in these four categories, 3% and 4%. And if the local government officials chose to 
do a 90-10 split. When I say 10, please understand I mean 9.75 and 0.25. It's just easier for me to say 90-10. That's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. Um 10% available to rural infrastructure just from the county of Missoula. If 2% uh, tax were placed on these categories would be about 1.2 million. If all of these counties put 2% and they all chose to do a 90-10 split, it'd be about 7.6 million for rural infrastructure. If they all decided to put a tax of 4% on those four categories, we're looking at 15.2 million for rural infrastructure that year. So what does that mean for the local property taxpayer? So uh, staff put together and collected data on um, the value of mills in these different counties, um, tax generation. We didn't do it at the city level. We wanted to keep to numbers that we were absolutely certain that we had down pat. So understand this is one scenario. If Cascade County doesn't wanna put this on a ballot, but Great Falls does, that number is going to be different. So please understand that that's where these assumptions are made. The assumption is that all eligible categories are taxed at the same rate and that 90% of the revenue is allocated to direct property tax reduction. The different levers that you can pull and we'll get to a, a widget later that I've sort of created to let you play with the numbers a bit, but it's not insignificant. So a $500,000 assessed home market value in Cascade County at 3% tax would decrease by 47%. Gallatin would drop 68%. Now this is county tax only. We all know that there are county or property taxes that local elected officials don't have control over. Citizens vote themselves in some of these levies. Um, we don't have the ability to decrease those. We have very little control over 100% of the budget, but what they do control, they can drop. We've attempted to balance state oversight and control with a need for local governments to reflect their own needs. We have attempted to Soften an increased tax burden on residents, low-income individuals, and renters, so while maintaining constitutional protections for everyone involved in our commerce. We acknowledge that our industries who cater to tourists could increase and will in in incur increased administrative burden, and therefore we want to offset that, that uh, harm. And we really did seek to address the most significant concerns that have been raised with the past iterations of local option sales taxes. This the local option sales tax proposals have been around for decades. Um, and it's, it's not like we've created something new, but what I think we really tried hard to do is listen to the best arguments against them and uh, fold it in, try and figure out a way to address them and, and uh, get them on board. Uh, we've brainstormed and listened and looked at data and best practices, and I uh, think it's a solid proposal. At this point, I would love to be able to toss up quickly this little thing. And compared to the, the robust tool that staff have created this year for the interim revenue, committee and Mara, it, this is kindergarten level, but uh, here you can see that you can adjust a tax rate, say if we want it to be 3%, this is how the numbers would change. If the local government decides to put 30% direct- I don't see anything, Jan. Are you oh, sure, trying to share something? I'm sure trying to. Let's see if I can fix this. There we go. Okay, so Got here it's 3%. If they decide that out of their 40% that they have control over, 30% of that goes directly to property tax reduction and they need 10% to other local needs. This is what those numbers would look like. Again, same assumptions. These were all taxed at the same rate. Given another couple of days, I could probably figure out how to make these adjustable as well, but it's not gonna happen this morning. So if they wanna put 40%, 
that means zero to other local needs, and it all goes to property tax reduction. If we drop that to 2.5%, those are gonna shift a little bit, et cetera. We also did these calculations for a house valued at 300,000 and 600,000 for each of these counties. And again, the impact is significant. $300,000 home in Lewis and Clark County at a 4% tax would be redu reduced from $350 to 338. These are county taxes only. So this deck has been sent to your staff and um, Am I still sharing? I'd like yeah, to you are. I'd like to stop my share. Please. There you go. You're done. Okay. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions and All talk right. to you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll open it up here for committee questions here. I just wanted to clarify um, one thing. So when you talk about property tax relief, are you talking to all taxpayers in the taxing jurisdiction? Uh, we are talking to residential uh, taxpayers and people for whom that resident is their primary residence. Okay. All right. And then you'd have, you have clarified several times that your percentage savings is only on county taxes. So kind of what I did was I looked at Flathead and Missoula County um, and, and interpolated that if you looked at the total tax bill, it'd probably be somewhere between six to 7% of your total tax bill um, that would be a reduction. I don't know if you've looked at those numbers or if if you would concur. Yeah. So <clears throat> what I did was pulled up my my tax bill for Lewis and Clark County. I live within the city limits as well. Um, I'm right there with you with the frustration of one tax bill doesn't look like the other tax bill doesn't look like the other tax bill, right? So I actually had difficulty finding where the county only taxes were on my tax bill. And I found it, it is there. It's not super clear, but it's there. And that part would be reduced. Yes, the the amount that the county only taxes make up is part of the pie, but we can control what we can control. And that's where we've decided to put that property tax relief. If a city passed it, it would go to the city portion. Perfect, perfect. okay. Uh, we will go to committee questions. Um, Cindy, you're up first. Yeah, unmute yourself there. Yeah, there we go. Okay, go I had I had um, several questions, but that's a it, this is a great proposal, Jen, and I really appreciate it. I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one is how much of a potential is this really to local government's budget, or how much of a positive impact is it really to their lo to local government budgets if the reduction of proper ta property tax is just being backfilled by local option tax, they, they potentially don't have any additional revenue in their budget. Um, it, have you done an analysis of the cost versus the benefit there? And then my second question is, um, we saw the seven large urban counties, but how um, effective is this proposal for small rural counties? Thank you very much for those questions. Yeah, both of those topics came up and they were hashed over and over again. I'm gonna take the first one first. Um, is, is it a help to local governments if you're simply reducing property taxes for your residents and not providing new revenue? I'm gonna, uh, straightforward, this group was not in consensus around this specific topic. Some communities thought that, yeah, we have to funnel it directly to property tax reduction and make do. Others were like, no, this we're strapped as it is. We need this new revenue to give the citizens and the residents the services that they are demanding that they need, that we are required to provide. Um, we settled on the 50-40, so 40% going to a certain number of categories. We hope that will feed some of the need of the cities that need new revenue. And we also fully acknowledge that um, 
this is not a version of anything that's going to make it across the finish line unchanged. And so we invited members of this coalition to raise their voice and articulate exactly why they need more than the 40% for other things or to, to pull the barriers off altogether. We were trying to be realistic about what we're bringing in front of this subcommittee, what we're bringing in front of the Montana legislature, um, what folks had an appetite for. We tried to hit a sweet spot in the middle. For the counties that would use it completely for property tax relief, what I heard from them is that easing, making it easier to live in their community is a benefit to the local government. So that's that's what I heard from them. On your second question, how does it impact? So it, you're saying if a rural county were to pass this, what would the numbers look like for them? Am I getting that question correct? Cindy, we did not run the numbers for a smaller county. And that was, that was a, a failure in the numbers, happy to do that. We focused on the large urban simply because we thought the large urban counties would be the most likely to want to place this on the ballot. I would be really interested though, as we continue this process and as we continue the conversation, I'd be really interested to see what those numbers would look like given the spend in different counties, right? I know that uh, say Beaverhead County, our largest county in Montana, it's the largest, right? Beaverhead County largest. Um, Dillon is a robust tourist community and they do a great trade in tourism and they may choose to put something in place locally. I would be very interested to look at those numbers. I don't have them for you today. Right. It would be it would be very interesting simply because property taxes, local government is wholly dependent on property taxes. And because of the road issue that occurred last in the last year's legislative season, um, it would be interesting to see the numbers. Thank you. Um, Kendall, you're up next. Thanks, Greg. Hey, Jen, good to see you. Um, thanks for the presentation. And I, my question is similar to what Cindy was asking about. Um, you mentioned it kind of at the end of your presentation that, um, you know, you, you were talking about there's some variables that you can't control, you know, growth of, of the budget um, kind of outside of the limitations on property taxes is one, one of those areas. And that's generally why, I guess, from my own personal perspective, I've been skeptical of local option proposals in the past because it just, from my perspective, it doesn't truly get to the heart of the problem, right? Which is like the, the growing burden of government, the growth of, of you know, budgetary expenditures. So uh, one of my questions for you was to see what would you, and, and I guess maybe the folks that you're working with think about, you know, maybe saying that this is an option but only an option for you know county governments that are keeping spending growth restrained uh, at a certain level. So it'd be like a reward for for good behavior. Um, that would seem to address some of the the variables that you know would be concerning, um, but also give you you know the people there the ability to spread out revenue. I want can I ask you some clarifying questions, Kendall? Sure. Okay, so when you say um, an option for governments keeping spending growth in control, <clears throat> would it be existing limits that local governments already have on, you know, percentages of rate of inflation for revenue, or would it be straight expenditure caps? I think personally, I think it needs to be focused on the expenditure side. And I think that it, it doesn't really matter so much like what metric we choose you know, but if we choose a metric and, and say, you got to stick to that, we have to have some sort of like restraint, yeah. then um, I think that that might be a good way to offset some of the concerns with this just, you know, like the concern would be this just adds another revenue stream and we're just continuing to grow spending. So what what do you kind of think about that concept? Okay, thank you for that. I, um, I'm not crazy about it, Kendall, and it's because we don't have control over the level of expenditures. We, meaning local governments, don't always have control over the level of expenditures. Just as the state of Montana is not writing checks out in the amount of just this, federal government funnels a lot of money through the state of Montana and says where we have to spend it. Same thing happens at the county level. Additionally, counties and cities are really good at going out and finding grants private and governmental grants to help 
bolster their local economy. Those are expenditures that go out, but it doesn't come from the taxpayers of that community. So those are just two examples, but there are several more of ways where if you constrain the expenditures, you would really be sort of asking them not to do the right thing, asking them not to look for other sources of funding to bring into their communities. As Cindy pointed out, if you only have one area to raise money, the property taxes, you're gonna have to get creative about where else to provide services to your people and they have. Local governments have been created creative about that. However, our industry has shifted so much that they need some more options on the table at the local level. I don't disagree that some sidewalls need to be put on, which is why we limited uh, what this revenue could be spent on. We didn't say, hi, wide and handsome, you can spin it on anything you want, go crazy. We said, these are the things that we think are appropriate for these impact fees to be spent on. And there are areas where are, they're hurting because of our shifted uh, industry, our shifted tourism economy. Thank you. Um, Senator McGillivray. Yeah, thank you. So I have uh, a, a few questions. The first one would be, did anybody calculate or think about how much the average resident would pay in that tax versus how much they would receive in a property tax reduction? Uh, you said you had a couple. Can I answer that one first? Yeah. Okay. God, we tried, um, or at least I tried. Not an economist, certainly not an economist, certainly not a tax expert, but staff went out and they tried to find information of out-of-state spend versus in-state spend and subtract from the total spend. And it really does vary community by community. I don't doubt that the data is out there somewhere, but it was really hard for us to find reliable sources that spread across categories as broad as that we as we needed to compare local to out-of-state spend. Um, I'm sure that if the Department of Commerce and Institute for Tourism and Recreational Research put their heads together, they're definitely those economists are going to come up with the right answer for you. I unfortunately do not have that answer for you. So I would just follow up with say not even a guess. Okay, you're gonna put me on the spot. I'm guessing about half of the restaurant spend comes from locals and half of it comes from out-of-state visitors. I'm guessing sure. I'm guessing 80% of the guides and outfitters revenue comes from out-of-state visitors versus in-state, right? I've got friends who travel to Eastern Montana and they hire a bow hunting guide uh, at the in late summer to help them figure out how to hunt that Eastern Montana landscape, which is so much different than Western Montana landscape. So we do spend money locally on those things. And I think the vast majority of those dollars come in from out of state. Um, I think that it's not gonna be a hundred percent offset for local folks getting back what they spend. But if we focus on uh, figuring out how to shield our low income elderly and full-time residents, it'll help. It's not perfect, but it's good. Okay, my next question is, I, I kind of didn't follow all the who decides question. Yeah. So let me ask the question this way. So you talked about a panel and I will obviously go back and read through your slides more carefully, but so could say Yellowstone County say 90% of our collection goes to directly to property tax reduction. I guess my first question is, is that a fact? Yes. In your model here. All right, the next question then is, who decides at the Yellowstone County level what split that's gonna be? So- Who picks that panel that you were talking about? The local governing board would appoint the board of directors in accordance with bylaws that they had adopted through the local government methods. So you introduce it, you get public input, uh, you form it, uh, you vote on the bylaws, et cetera. You form this board of directors. The board of directors advises the local government on how that 40% is spent. They make a, make a recommendation to the council commissioners or the city council um, on how that 40% is spent. The city council or the county commissioners can choose to follow the recommendation or not, that is their prerogative. 
And if they don't, that's certainly something I campaign against them with. So I think okay. that we have a natural check if we don't listen to the boards that we've created. Um, and at the same time, we got to give leaders the ability to lead. So 40% to answer your question directly is uh, the local board of directors makes a recommendation on how that expenditure should occur. 50% for sure have got to go to property tax reduction. 9.75.25 goes elsewhere. And 40%, you have a menu of area you can spend it on. Okay, I, I want to back up then again. So I'm looking at your little pie graph here on my other screen. And you have 50% directed to property tax reduction. So back to my other question. My question was, can 90% of the revenue go to property tax? Maybe I misunderstand. Are we talking about 50% of 90% of 50% of 90% of the entire collection? 90% of the entire collection. So if you're looking at that uh, pie chart, yeah, that circle, you'll see the gray is that 50%. That's state of state of Montana saying local officials, you got to spend at least half of this on direct property tax reduction. The green is there. I'm going to, I'm going to say it's discretionary, but it's not hundred percent discretionary. So 40% of that, the board advises local government how to spend that. If they say, we want to throw this in the gray pile, that equals a 90% of the total going to direct property tax reduction. If All they right, so, the, so clarify then. Yes. The local government has discretion to say, we want 90% in our gray pie. That's correct. We want 90% property tax, but they, but they do have discretion. And I would need to dig a little more down into the weeds about Again, who's selecting that board, how that board selected. And I'll be frank, my I'm warm to the idea, but skeptic, skeptical uh, on the local government. I'm I'm warm to the idea of the collection and then 90% or 100% going to property tax reduction. I'm skeptical that the local government boards would agree with my thinking and that they would probably say 50% goes to property tax. And then I think, again, I'm speculating because I don't have hard numbers. Yeah. It's a wash then. Yeah. It's a wash to the local because <clears throat> what I pay will probably be a wash with what I save. Yeah. Anyhow, that's, that's kind of the information I think that's great feedback, sir. And I must say, I'm excited that you're at least warm to it. So that's a win for me. Um, the uh, I, I also have to say that I think that there are some local uh, boards who would put it all toward property tax relief because quite frankly, they're being inundated every single day. They can't go anywhere without hearing, like, this is my tax bill, what the heck? Like, why don't you fix this? Property tax relief, property tax relief. So if they say, all right, we put 90% of this new revenue straight into property tax relief and it still hurts, he's, here are the folks that you should talk to next. Um, additionally, I think there are some local communities that would choose to spend that 40% elsewhere. And I think they know their communities. I think that they are elected by their friends, neighbors, and fellow colleagues. I think that uh, they're duly elected in free and fair elections, and they have the right to serve their citizens the way they think is best. The citizens don't like it. The citizens will replace them. So um, I'm sure that there are some folks who will present testimony and public comment that are from some different communities who have an opinion on where that will go. I think those are all good questions, sir, and um, I encourage the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Commissioner Logan. Thank you, Greg. Um, so I think ride and drag here on the questioning part, I'm, I've got most of my questions answered. Um, but I, I do want to clarify one thing. So did I understand correctly that the property that's getting the relief the tax relief, that's residential. Yes, yeah, so residential property for 
those folks who use it as their primary residence or a long-term rental. Okay, so this doesn't apply to commercial property. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the terms that was used, rural infrastructure, what's that? <clears throat> so I don't have the definition in front of my face. It, the, our intention is for infrastructure to be used as the BARSA funds are used to rural counties. So water systems, sewage treatment plants, roads, streets, curbs, highways, things like that. Uh, horizontal infrastructure, not vertical infrastructure. Uh, for a more specific conversation about that, I would refer you to the Montana Infrastructure Coalition. They're the true experts on all of the things that are listed in those items. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then lastly, um, so the board that you and Mr. McGilvery spoke of just a few seconds ago, is that an advisory board? Um, I believe you could name it an advisory board, right? A board of directors advisory board. They oversee the collection. They oversee the allocation. So you want an independent body making sure that that specific collection and flow through is being accounted for appropriately and to report annually to the legislature. Those are the folks that would show up in front of the legislature and report on where the money comes from and where they sent it. So, so, so rel relative, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. They advise the, the local elected officials, whether that's a council or a commission. Okay, so the, the local elected officials could undo that. I mean, they could make ultimate, ultimately the decision is theirs. Is that correct? That's and they correct. Could, yeah. They could change, uh, change up the decisions that okay. were made by the board of directors. Ultimately, I look at it as a committee and a committee of the whole, right, in Montana legislature. So a committee brings forward a recommendation to pass or not to pass, um, or they, they, you know, make the motion do pass, do concur. And the body can ignore that recommendation. The okay. body can say, you know, you guys heard all the details. You've got the most information about it, but that's just, this just does not sit right with me. I'm going to vote against it. And that happens quite often. Um, you respect the recommendation of the committee. You think about it. You take it into consideration. There might be very good reasons for going against that recommendation. And if there's not, you'll certainly hear about it. And so the elected officials are the ones who are ultimately accountable. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Eric, Dale, you have a question? Uh, yeah, just real quickly. Um, when I initially heard your presentation, I assumed that the dollars would be used to reduce mills, but then you mentioned that it would be more targeted than that. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on how you perceive that targeting to happen, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, so those are, that's a really good question, Eric. I know that there are a lot of other proposals out there that do really specifically target all this revenue gain to say buy down 95 mills for the, the schools, et cetera. Those are details that have yet to be developed. We started to go down that hole and then decided if we come in front of this group with all of the answers specifically, then A, you're gonna be bored and you're not gonna have anything to do and B, um, it's a little presumptive of us to assume that we've got all the answers at the get-go, given the amount of work that other groups are doing as well. We invite the discussion on that. We don't have that dialed in. So just a comment on that, um, Eric, and what Whitefish does with their resort tax is they figure out how big the pie is. They could provide relief to all property taxpayers, commercial, residential, and then they, they just cut it up. It's right on your tax bill. Um, and last 2023, it was about $40 of relief for every hundred thousand dollar value of a resident. So it's, um, you can see it right on the bill. It's just, a, just a credit on the bill. Thanks. Cindy, do you have a question? Maybe not a question so much as a comment. Um, and maybe Jen, you could consider it for me. Um, I see a scenario where a rural taxpayer may participate in contributing to the reduction in the property tax burden for urban residents, but not necessarily receiving any benefits. 
in fact, they could be negatively impacted if uh, any additional burden gets transferred to agriculture, you know, to to backfill the property taxes that maybe don't get completely taken care of. I'm sorry, I'm not following your, your so, could you say yeah, that again for me? So, so me as a farmer, yes. I, I would go to Great Falls and buy my groceries. Yes. I'm paying I'm paying a local option tax to um back I'm paying a local option tax to reduce the property taxes in oh. that community. Yep. But if the if it were a county if it were a county option tax, um obviously anywhere in the county where I go buy my groceries, I'm gonna I'm gonna be paying to reduce the residential property tax. That property tax bill, if it's not enough to fulfill the needs of the county who instituted the option tax, what's to prevent them from shifting that additional burden back to my farm? Mm -hmm. That's a it's an excellent question and, and it's a scenario that we talked about a lot. <clears throat> so you going into Great Falls, say the city passed the tax and the county did, I'm assuming you're your spread is in Cascade County. So you technically under that scenario are a visitor into Great Falls, right? Using their streets and bridges and roads. And that's what some of the folks argued. They're like, well, if somebody comes in, regardless of why to, to purchase stuff at the grocery store, or go to high school basketball games or have a staycation mm -hmm. away downtown Great Falls, that is still impacting the city residents and the city pays for these things. In your situation, so does the county, right? So do you as an agricultural landowner. Um, what's to stop them from sliding it on top of you all? I think good public policy, first of all, you're electing the right individuals to office and a uh, member of the Cascade County Commission was a very active uh, architect of a lot of these details. So we listened a lot to him. Um, I don't, I don't have a good answer for what's to stop them. I, I don't think they could be stopped from doing that. Do I think it's likely? No. Okay, thank All you. All right, um, is there any more questions from the committee before we go to um, public comment? We'll come back around to after public comment and discuss a little bit more. Senator McGilvery. Yeah, uh, Jen, I was just wondering the tool you were playing with, where do we yeah. access that tool? I'm going to be sending that to Mr. Franklin and he's going to make sure that you get access to it. Is that right, Mr. Franklin? Is that okay? Can I offer up your service? Yes, that's one? perfect. Great. Uh, I'm here for Thank you. All right, I'm going to open it up to public comment and if um, just raise your hand if you want to talk and then um, try to be succinct. Let's make sure we're focusing here on this local option tax. So um who's ever in control here ralph or whatever go ahead and start calling on the public members with their hands up i see mm -hmm. you right now. i think brandy will begin to elevate people okay to panelists one at a time go ahead, see we got Am I up? Okay. Good morning daryl james i'm the executive director for the montana infrastructure coalition just wanted to add a little bit of color on a couple of issues. Um, one, I think to uh, Commissioner Logan's question about uh, kind of where that money could be spent at the local level. If you think about this as Cascade County or Lewis and Clark County assessing the, the tax, um, Jen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume that, that that tax revenue then would stay at the county level. So that, that, that revenue that could be spent um, on infrastructure would be limited to county roads and bridges, county health, county detention, county sheriff, it would not be eligible for a city park in Helena or a city park in Cascade, right? So just to make sure we're clear on whoever assesses that tax um, would also be eligible to spend that. It doesn't It doesn't go to somebody else's pot. That also takes me to a, a clarification on what uh, Kendall Cotton was talking about, um, kind of on the, you know, can we, can we cap growth in local government spending. I want to make sure it's very clear that if the county were to, to assess this tax, the county makes up roughly, what, 20, 30% max of the overall property tax burden. 
schools in general are upwards of 50%. Uh, cities are around 30, 35%. That's general statewide average. So if you were to suggest that you're going to cap, quote unquote, cap the growth in local government spending, uh, you're not seeing a whole lot of growth in county government spending, right? They're pretty steady, pretty low. It's a small portion of the overall property tax burden. So you'd have to look at where that actual growth is coming. In most communities, most of the growth is coming from school school spending, right? And those are levies to support bonds that are that are passed by wide margins in those communities. Same is true for a, a city um, safety bond, right? So that's where you're seeing some of the growth. Um, so just keep that in mind when you when you think about a cap. There are really three independent functions within within the property tax formula. Very very important to keep in mind. Lastly, to Cindy's question about a tax shift, that really is why you would not apply this to a reduction in mills. That is just as as Senator Hertz talked about. It's just a flat reduction on your overall tax burden because if you reduce mills. Then 15, 10, 4, 20 goes into effect. And then you're then you're looking to make up mills. And that would be shifted to industrial and ag properties. So that's why it makes a whole lot more sense to just provide a flat reduction in, in the tax. Um, I think that covers what I wanted to hit real quick. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, Randy, who's up next? That'll be John Ag. John, John Iverson. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, John Iverson representing the Montana Tavern Association. Uh, you know, my members pay property tax, they pay payroll tax, they pay income tax, they pay alcohol tax, they pay gambling tax. We are, I believe, uh, you know, being part of the solution. Uh, and, and, and frankly, if if our businesses felt like they could raise their prices by 4% and not impact consumer behavior, they would do so. Uh, but even the presenter acknowledged that they don't want to hit retail goods because they they acknowledge that that consumer behavior changes uh, in the margins uh, when these types of fees are tacked on, and so we should expect the same to occur at bars and restaurants if we add an extra tax uh, on all, all all consumers utilizing our services. Uh, the presenter indicated uh, that she's frustrated that property tax bills from one county to the next are not the same. Now imagine this, I'm sitting in Helena right now. Let's say that Helena does a local option tax, East Helena does a local option tax. Uh, I could own four grocery stores, one in Helena, one in East Helena, one between Helena and East Helena, and one in Jefferson County. Those are all five minutes from where I sit right now. And each one of those grocery stores will have a different tax rate on different goods for those consumers. Can you imagine how complicated that would be to have uh, units in multiple taxing jurisdictions? And in each jurisdiction, a local committee is deciding what goods are taxed and what goods are not taxed in that particular store. And then the store on the other side of the street isn't taxed the same way because they're in a, because of an ar you know arbitrary governmental line, like a like a city, a city boundary. I think something else to consider that I, I was concerned about is what if the city and the county both want the 4%. Does one get to supersede the other or do they both get to do it? And so I think that's something uh, we need to look at as well. Um, and, and an additional thing I think we need to consider is who's gonna confirm that the businesses are playing by the rules? Is, is Department of Revenue gonna do that? Or is each local county gonna have uh, sales tax auditors that check in on the bars, taverns, convenience stores, grocery stores to make sure that they're taxing the right items and not taxing items that shouldn't be taxed. Uh, so you know, all, all in all, I think this is this is a terribly complicated proposal that'll ha it'll have a huge administrative burden on small independent businesses. And the businesses that I represent are already carrying a significant tax burden. Uh, they don't need to carry an additional tax burden. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, next up. Looks Hi, like uh, Mr. Story. I tried to unmute. Am I on mute now? Yes, you are. All right. Well, thanks, Jen, for the great presentation and the work you've done on it. I think some of, a lot of the data previously that was used in these kind of studies come out of the census data. And I don't know if Dan Dodds is still in the world or not, but he's the guy that knows how to get that information and stuff. 
I just have a couple. Uh, I agree with a lot of things that Mr. Iverson just said, you know, about about the administration of a local option tax without a statewide sales tax in place to piggyback on. But um, Eric Dale's question about how you provided tax relief, I think, is important. Um, you know, Whitefish really does it through kind of a mill reduction. They apply it to all, to all property there. And I think, I don't know how a, a city or county is going to apportion that money to to residential property owners. Um, I mean, basically, uh, all property tax bills are based on mills uh, applied equally to all properties. And so the, the if you've been following what's going on with the other subcommittee that looks at looking at equity and they're talking about residential relief they're basically doing it through the tax rate because they're dealing with statewide uh, property assessment and valuation so you can direct tax relief to residential property that way but to do it um at the uh, only to apply to residential and and um rental properties i think is that's what you're aiming at is uh, more difficult at the local level unless you just uh, do some kind of a flat rate thing and but i also have been concerned about the collection mechanism i don't think you know we i've worked on these bills a lot in, in my previous life and um Everyone said, well, the uh, resort communities don't have any problem dealing with the administration of these taxes, but most of them are fairly small communities with a limited number of businesses in them, and they, they know who the businesses are, and they have pretty good buy-in from the businesses on it, and so they're, I mean, they think they're fairly confident that they're collecting the right amount of money, but I think when you get in the large cities where you have a lot more diversity of business ownership and different things going on there that it's going to take a substantial effort by uh, local government to administer one of these as mr iverson said you know how do you how do you audit and how do you collect and how do you disperse and those types of things so those are some things i guess it'll be worked on as it goes through the process i guess um the other question that always comes up was also asked about do you have a race to the tax to between the city and the county who gets who put in it stalls the tax first because if a city gets there first it pretty much precludes the county from doing a tax because it's basically it would take all the city's money and put it back to the county because most of these revenues are going to be collected inside the city limits because that's where the bulk of the uh, taxable entities are and looking at the list of activities that were taxed um and i know that wasn't exhaustive and it will get amended as it goes along but i think you're missing some of the recreational things when we tried to do the statewide tourism tax in 2003 some of the things that we also included were um entertainment events um uh, ski hills and those types of recreational things that aren't guided and outfitted uh you might go back and see if you can find that original bill that senator deprato brought in 2003 that created the statewide tourism tax that got stripped down to basically what we have now a bed tax or sales tax on hotel motel rooms and rental cars but it it covered a lot of those types of things also but and then finally, Jan, I know you don't have the computer analysis the Department of Revenue does, but it, when you were doing your calculation on tax relief in, in the counties, I don't know what county levies you were including. You know, you implied some of them you couldn't deal with because they were voted levies and stuff like that. But in Lewis and Clark County, for example, I mean, we calculate that the county collects 213 mills uh, across all of the various functions that they do in, in Lewis and Clark County. And their taxable value last year was about 166 
million dollars. So they're collecting maybe $35 million in the county for property taxes. And so I don't know if that's kind of the number you were using that you were offsetting or if you were using a smaller number, because I'm kind of surprised like in Gallatin and, and Missoula County or Gallatin and some of the other counties that you had such a huge offset in the county tax levies. So you might have been using a a smaller group of uh, county funded services in that. But so it'd be interesting to see what all you included in that. But thank you for your work in the presentation. I know it's a heavy lift. Not going to get much support from us. Thank you, Mr. Story. Okay, um, next up. Melissa. Um, it's like we got Melissa. Lewis. Melissa Lewis. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Melissa Lewis, and I'm here today on behalf of myself as a registered state lobbyist and also representing my client, the Molson Coors Beverage Company. I'm happy to provide feedback and insights about the local option sales tax policy consideration that you have before you today. First, I'd like to offer a sincere thank you to each and every one of you for contributing your time and expertise to consider options provide for providing meaningful, sustainable homeowner tax relief. As lawmakers on this subcommittee know, a local option sales tax is not a new concept in Montana. Past efforts to enact a lo local option sales tax have failed for various reasons. First, a local option sales tax is definitely a sales tax. Um, not only is it a sales tax, but it is a regressive sales tax that is assessed regardless of income. As a result, a local option sales tax takes a larger percentage of income from low income groups than from high income groups. And in this case, it would actually be a double whammy as the local option sales tax proposed today would only benefit those who own property in Montana, not renters, students, seniors in retirement communities, or your other constituents who, who do not own property. Long-term long effects on Montana's tax system are definitely worth noting as an important policy consideration to contemplate when evaluating tax proposals before you. Um, <clears throat> our state constitution has a 4% cap on sales taxes, so serious questions do come up regarding what would happen in the future if a statewide sales tax is enacted. Local option sales taxes also impact Montanans year-round. Those most impacted would be the trade area residents who actually live in the trade area year-round, or those folks from surrounding counties who travel to the trade area to purchase goods. One of the people on the meeting today mentioned maybe traveling from the county to come into a larger city to shop, um, you know, Costco, Target, you name it. Those individuals, those Montanans coming from outside of the trade commerce area to purchase goods in that area would be paying yet not receiving benefits from the proposal. Local option sales taxes um, could also negatively impact Montana's brick and mortar businesses. Um, both small and large, depending on the menu of items that are contemplated to be to be taxed. Um, E-commerce, as Ms. Henley, Ms. Hensley had noted, such as Amazon, doesn't currently pay sales tax or a local option sales tax. So um, providing e-commerce with that advantage would, would essentially give uh, e-commerce an, an un unfair competitive advantage to our brick and mortar businesses that are and would be subject to a local option sales tax. Um, in the past, our county clerks and recorders have engaged in past legislative sessions to express anguish over the administrative nightmare that would be cr created with a local option sales tax because there is not a system in place to collect, retain, or remit local option sales taxes. This is a, a burden that would be um, especially large and costly and problematic in our smaller communities who may not have the administrative resources uh, without hiring new staff. A local option sales tax is also not often viewed as a viable replacement for property taxes, um, as it likely would not generate enough revenue to make a meaningful impact. Um, finally, some fear that a local option sales tax might only make the problem worse in Montana by fueling the growth of spending at the local level, which some believe lies at the heart of the problem. 
Um, one of my clients is the Molson Coors Beverage Company, which I mentioned at the beginning, and I've been granted permission to share just a couple of facts and figures um, from Molson Coors with you today. As we talk about the cost versus benefit of a proposal like this, um, it's really important to look at all of the all of the costs um, before you. So. Um, this is prepared by Molson Coors. I'd be happy to share a copy um, with you. This um, model was prepared on behalf of Miller Coors by John Dunham and Associates. And I've got the um, source data here too, if you would like. But Montana currently um, is considering a proposal that would allow localities and counties to impose a 4% sales tax on beer and other products. If this tax were to be introduced statewide, it could lead to significant losses for local breweries and hospitality firms. The tax change results in a 2.68 per case of beer increase in the weightage average price. Um, this tax change will harm the state economy, reduce jobs in the hospitality industry and the industries that supply it, hurt Montana's working poor and raise relatively little in additional revenue. Such a large increase in the price of beer could result in severe jobs, sales and income losses. Raising taxes in Montana will marginally increase local revenues, but at a high economic price. It is estimated that the tax increase will result in lost sales of 317,140 cases of beer, thus impacting hospitality venues. It is likely that roughly 370 jobs would be lost due to this tax. And that is based on data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics for the leisure and hospitality sector. Job losses include those from higher taxes on beer, wine, distilled spirits, and other beverage, and other beverage alcohol products. This tax increase could cost Montana as much as $53 million in economic activity due to a decline in sales. At the same time, the tax will raise only about $32 million in state and local taxes, resulting in a net loss to the state's economy of $21 million after taking into effects um, after taking all of those effects into account. With Montana already facing 19,400 unemployed persons, now is not a good time to increase job killing taxes. Um, and finally, the tax proposal increases the sale of beer to Montana residents by retailers in other states that will now have lower taxes. Montana will lose as many as 67,070 cases of beer sales, leading to $20,930 less in beer excise taxes because of the high taxes will drive cross-border sales of beer, those residing closer to the North Dakota border, for example. Um, in effect, the tax will benefit border states with lower tax rates like Wyoming. Thank you. Well, so if you could email that um, to Ralph Franklin, and then he can disperse it to a committee members. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, we will do. Thank you. All right. Um, next up, um, Brad Longcake. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the committee. Um, Brad Longcake, for the record, I uh, represent the Montana Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association. Uh, thank you for the opportunity um, to speak today. And I think Jen done a good job um, putting this together. We would like to be part of that coalition that she's describing as we hadn't been contacted on this. So it would be nice to be able to put some uh, input in this. I think you've heard um, a lot of the same uh, issues that we've had from Mr. Iverson and uh, Ms. Lewis. So I'm not going to reiterate those. I think the biggest thing um, that oftentimes is unlooked on this is just the uh, additional burden that's placed on any type of location that has to be responsible for collecting and remitting um, the accounting and, and, and process that it takes to ensure that these products are allocated correctly. I think Mr. Iverson hit on another point that's extremely challenging when you have businesses that are in multiple cities and counties across the entire state. Um, you know, using the example of a candy bar, if one county city is different price and you've got local distribution groups that are responsible for that, it's extremely difficult to break that down into those communities to ensure that you're doing that accurately. Um, I think the other part that's really interesting on this is that when you look at, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a small town in Shelby on the High Line. I live in Helena now, but um, just doing sporting events, traveling across the entire state, you see the differences in these communities and the value that, um, you know, these business, local businesses provide to them in forms of 
you know, supporting these communities. And it, it's, it's challenging to figure out if the squeeze is going to be worth the juice on this, because at the end of the day, everybody's paying more for those products that you choose to use. Ms. Hensley said that you don't have to go out to eat, but I think that's unrealistic. There's times when you're forced to, if you're at a sporting event or you're out of town, you are just a tourist in those communities. And, um, you know, it's just adding that additional cost, no matter what you do, because um, you're buying gas, you're paying fuel tax. If you have to stay overnight, you're paying, um, you know, that additional tax in that hotel. Um, you know, it's, I appreciate the creative thinking on how to make this work. But at the end of the day, I think it's very challenging when you're cherry picking different items and or businesses that could potentially be um, you know, winners or losers and this kind of thing. And that's why we really supported, um, somebody had mentioned Barca. It was the statewide gas tax across. It's flat, it's equal. Everybody knows where it's going. Um, you know, and that raised significant money for those local communities over the last six years. So I think something like this, where again, you're you're just cherry picking the items and or the county, cities and individuals that are required to pay. I just don't think that's probably the best mechanism to try to generate uh, those dollars to get to the end root of the of the of the issue. So with that, thank you for the opportunity and would appreciate to be uh, part of this group moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Longcake. Okay, next up look, looks like someone from the Mogul office is calling in. If you could identify yourself, thank you. Uh, members of the commission, my name is William Israel. I'm the uh, executive director for the Montana Outfitters and Guides Association. I, I do appreciate the extensive amount of work that you guys have done so far uh, on this specific subject. And I know that it's a, it's a difficult one. And I, I don't want to belabor many of the great points that have been made thus far by Brad Longcake, um, Daryl James, John Iverson, Melissa Lewis, and Bob Story. But I, I do want to raise a pretty significant concern uh, when it comes to the outfitter and guide industry in specific is that we have about 800 outfitters um, that are uh, on record in the Montana Board of Outfitters. Um, what they do and 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 what how they get to that position, I, I just want to share that. A lot of these are, are legacy companies that uh, some of them uh, started the the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Uh, many of them have been in in business uh, legacy wise, going on 60. 70 even 100 years they've worked very very hard uh for 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 some more than a century to be able to provide a, a public service for uh people who would never be able to get into areas like the bob marshall wilderness never be able to get out hunt and fish and do the uh, activities that, uh, that are here in montana and and what they go through to get there um is significant uh there there is there are so many costs associated, taxes, fees associated working with working on public lands, uh, potentially on private lands um, that they go through that they already pay uh, that uh, that go into the uh, <clears throat> go into the Montana economy. In addition to the jobs that are created, we have some outfitters. If you were to look at uh, like Mike Cooney up in the Flathead, uh, Mike Cooney has two hundred employees. Um, that he that he runs and he provides significant uh, support for Glacier Park and allowing people to get out there um, and utilize those uh, those benefits of, of nature. And so taxing, throwing a, a, a tax onto on top of a very small component of, uh, of Montana's um, outfitters and guides on top of what they're already paying. Uh, into federal taxes, into their own personal property taxes, into running their businesses, employee taxes is a pretty significant burden. So I, I, I would just like personally to request that, that we are a part of this process as well. We appreciate, um, you know, the hard work and, and the challenge of this, uh, uh, of this effort that you're a part of. And so I don't, I don't want to degrade that or, or uh, um, undercut that in any way whatsoever. But I, I, I do think that uh, something like a two to four percent tax across the state uh, on some of these guides and outfitters who are already heavily um, underneath that burden and trying to take care of their families and their businesses uh, would be pretty detrimental. So I thank you all. I appreciate it. Um, and and have a have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Israel. It looks like to me we are done with public comment. So 
Um, I know we're way over time here, committee, but I wanted to make sure we allocated uh, ample um, discussion here on this particular topic. So um, with that, public comment is ended there. And so we can go back to um, committee comment. If anybody um, has any general overall comment they, they want to talk about, I, I, I don't want to make a decision today yet uh, as we're, if we're going to endorse this or oppose it. I think we need to um, absorb it a little bit and we've got time. We can come back at our next meeting to, to, to look through it. So does anybody have any particular comment they'd like to make? Mr. Chairman, will um, a synopsis of these subcommittees will all be presented at the regular working group meeting next week, correct? Correct. Yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about on at Monday. Yes. All right. Um, so I don't see anybody with their hands up who would like to comment. So with that, we will um, end this discussion on um, local option sales tax. Um, thank you, Ms. Hensley, for um, your presentation. And um, uh, you know, we'll, um, if we have any further questions, um, we'll be reaching out and um, see if we need to clarify anything else as we move forward. So, um, thank you for your time. You bet. All right. So next up on the agenda is one of our own committee uh, members, uh, Manish, um, with the Tax Foundation. Uh, just thought I listened in on his on the tax foundation. He had a discussion about property taxes um, across the country. And so uh, I thought it would be a good idea if uh, Manish could just provide us uh, maybe with a, a summary of uh, what they're discussing, discussing across the country. So Manish, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. And uh, hello, committee members and, and everyone else who's listening. And uh, uh, Ms. Hensley, thank you for a great presentation. I certainly hope that mine's half as engaging and informative. Um, and uh, Senator uh, Hertz said it correctly. We had a webinar last week at the Tax Foundation, uh, actually uh, earlier this month at the Tax Foundation, and um, we discussed several trends around the country. It was an hour long. I would I would suggest if you're interested to to tune in, uh, not so much for me, but for my colleague, Jared Walczak, who um, is very eloquent on these issues. I do have some slides, uh, sir, so I'd like to share my screen. I have already shared them with, um, albeit contemporaneously with uh, Mr. Franklin. Um, if that's okay with you. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. We can see them. Perfect. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so um, I wanted to provide, again, a high level, uh, discussion of what we discussed um, a few weeks ago. Uh, the idea being that as, if there are questions or if anyone in the committee would prefer um, more detailed analysis, I'm certainly happy to put that together and provide that at a, at a later date, um, either in written form or again through this sort of format. There are throughout the country, uh, in every state that I work in, uh, a number of property tax challenges, a number of property tax proposals, uh, and the general consensus is that the property tax, at least the, the way I speak about it, is probably the most misunderstood, the most maligned, uh, yet can be, when structured correctly, a good tax overall. Uh, to sort of frame the conversation that I want to have, again, at a very high level, is at the Tax Foundation, we talk about the property tax being a transparent tax, something that you, as a property owner, you know what you're paying. Uh, and this is not a surprise to you uh, or anyone listening into this call, but if I were in a state that said that actually had a sales tax, I can guarantee you that very few taxpayers know what they paid in sales taxes each year, but they do know what they paid in their property tax. And so from a transparency perspective, it is um, one of the most transparent taxes, and that probably makes it one of the most maligned taxes. It's generally a neutral tax. Uh, when we talk about neutrality when it comes to the property tax, what we mean is that because it's a tax on generally on, and I'm really speaking about real property here, immovable assets, uh, there's there's relatively little competition among states. You can't pick up your house and move it across state lines to, to avail yourself of a better property tax rate, right? Um, and so there's less competition and also less avoidance activity. Uh, generally, again, when, albeit imperfectly, but when structured correctly, a property tax comports with the public, uh, public finance uh, principle of, uh, sorry, the benefit principle of public finance. And that just means the taxes you pay should correspond generally, maybe imperfectly, with the benefits you receive. And as you pay property taxes, the things you're funding, police, fire, schools, a good school district generally raises your home value. We say that the property tax is often self-reinforcing. And so that's just a general way we think about the property tax at the tax foundation, transparency, neutrality, 
the benefit principle and the reinforcing capabilities of a property tax. Okay, so the property tax, as you know, is one of the most, uh, it's probably one of the primary funders of local government. We talk about that a lot on this committee and in, in, the, in the task force overall. Nationally, we see about 72% of local tax revenue is, is made up of property tax. Uh, now, the next statistic is the housing values overall nationally are up 33, uh, a little over 33%, and in some places much more. The, this is based on census data. So it's really about, it's looking at year 2022 and comparing it to year 2019. And so from 2019 and 2022, we saw a 33% increase. If you look at the, if you look at more private uh, sector uh, analysis, the Case-Shiller Index, for example, they put that number at 46%. And that, that number goes to January, 2024. So that from a private sector index, January, 2024, we're seeing na nationally a 46% rise overall in property taxes. People are paying more uh, it, from, from their pockets in property taxes nationally, but we're seeing about a, a little over 14% increase in the general uh, homeowners or property owners uh, property tax bill. And in real terms, local government collections are actually down five and a half percent compared uh, to 2019. Again, these are based on the census's numbers. So if taxpayers are paying more, but local governments are collecting less, uh, what's the answer? Uh, why is that happening? And we sort of attribute that to, to inflation. So I want to just put that out there that we talk about property tax rises almost exclusively being attributed to this, this valuation increase. But there is another culprit in this, and that's and that is that is the, the fact that inflation is playing into uh into this property tax calculation. Now I am not an economist, very want to be that uh transparent about that. I'm a tax attorney, so please don't don't turn off your screens or hang up just yet. But um there is something more than just the valuation. Um, issue here. So what are states doing? Around the country, and again, in every state that I work in, there is a rush to get property tax relief. And I'm really proud of Montana for taking, I think, a, a principled and a principled approach and a strategic approach to providing relief. Uh, that said, most relief options around the country are always well intended, right? It's provide relief to the people who need it. Sometimes those uh, relief options have unintended consequences. I wanted to provide a brief overview of some of the ones that I see around the country most often and, and, and provide some tangible um, examples. So obviously everyone knows what the homestead exemption is. Um, the homestead exemption is one of the most popular. Uh, most jurisdictions have a homestead exemption, this idea that we're gonna exempt a part of the assessed value of a home uh, from taxation, uh, provide a pre preferential rate to primary homeowners versus secondary homeowners. Um, and uh, this creates some concerns. We've talked about shifting the burden on this committee a number of times. Um, and to put a real uh, finer point on that, in some jurisdictions where commercial property includes larger uh, multi-unit apartment buildings, that, built, that, that shift is directly onto the renter. Uh, we think the property owners are paying that, but in reality, they're, they're, they're building and padding that into the rent. And that does hurt, uh, has long-term effects because it tends to hurt not just uh, younger individuals, but lower income individuals. And so there are some real downsides and side effects to to a uh, to a homestead exemption. Texas uh, recently raised uh, through the ballot uh, the homestead exemption to $100,000. And some taxpayers have over $100,000 of homestead exemption. I can tell you that in Texas, there are a number of school districts where wherein the median home value in that district is under $100,000. So if 72% of local collections is attributable to, attributable to property taxes, what would happen to those jurisdictions where the median home value is under $100,000? That's a significant loss of local revenue um, and could have some long-term effects. A lot of jurisdictions use tax swaps, and we talk about them being uh, typically four types of tax swaps, a, a tax swapping a state tax for another state tax, uh, say uh, raising a sales tax to provide income tax reductions, or a state for a local tax swap, uh, a local for state uh, tax swap, and a local for local, which is a little bit what we just talked about earlier, right? A, a local property tax being swapped for a local option uh, income tax. And, and generally, um, at the state level, we talk about state governments using their own revenue streams to provide relief for property taxes. Uh, th there are some concerns with this too. Uh, initially, these tax swaps could provide relief um, uh, in, in exchange for a reduction in the millages, but rarely do we see tax swaps uh, accompany with controls that prevent local governments from just raising those millages back to where they were. 
Um, and so oftentimes we see tax swap work in say year one, and then as we move further and further down the line, the tax swap uh, is seen as really just a subsidy to local government without a real long-term relief uh, strategy for, yeah. for, the, for property owners. And even if you put uh, the appropriate controls in place, say through a levy limit, which I'll get to uh, later, you are shifting where the revenue comes from. And that shift is really important. So in this case, we're not talking about a shift in the burden, but we're talking about a shift in where the collection is coming from. And these shifts have trade-offs and they could hurt the overall competitiveness and the opportunities for growth for a state. So for example, if you are swapping uh, one tax for say an income tax, and you end up raising an income tax to lower, say, a property tax, or you institute a sales tax for a property tax relief. This could affect migration. It could affect the um, job seeking uh, of, of people wanting to either live in the state or move around within the state. Uh, we see migration happening not just nationally, but uh, within a state. We saw in a state, uh, we see states that sometimes where the state will reduce the statewide income tax rate, but the localities increase, say, the the lo local income tax rate, we see people moving from one jurisdiction to another to avail themselves of a lower local income tax rate. So these, these where you generate the revenue is is important. It could it could really have a significant in, impacts to to growth and competitiveness. So when we talk about assessment limits, this makes a lot of sense when people think about oh how do I provide proper tax relief? I want to provide, I want to cap the ability of assessed values to rise, and that makes a lot of sense except for the fact that assessment limits come with some real drawbacks. Uh, they tend to create what we call the lock-in effect, where you have uh, families choosing or opting not to go to bigger homes when their family or income increases, purchasing power increases. We that, that, that has really a lot of downside effects on lower income families that are trying to get out of a rental unit and into a, an, own, uh, an ownership situation or younger individuals who just don't have the purchasing power yet to get into those starter homes where the inventory end up, ends up getting uh, fewer and fewer because people aren't trading up to bigger and bigger houses to fit their needs and their purchasing power. Assessment limits tend to disincentivize new construction because that would trigger a new assessment. It does, tends to disincentivize major home renovation. Again, that would trigger a new assessment. And it's very possible in an assessment limit regime where you have two properties in the same neighborhood that are substantially similar, if not identical, uh, paying vastly different property taxes. And uh, that's accountable only to the date of purchase. Similarly, when we think of providing rate uh, relief to property tax, we think, why, don't, why wouldn't we cap the rate of property tax? Why don't we just cap it? For all people. Well, sounds great up front. It does nothing to control what we're seeing uh, throughout uh, the country, these surges in, uh, in valuations. So we tend to think that the, the most neutral way to provide uh, property tax relief is through a levy limit. And I know Montana has several of these um, relief options uh, within, within the statute. Uh, we do think they're the most effective uh, when they're shaped uh, appropriately because levy limits are concerned more with collection what local governments are able to collect. And uh, I always talk about it that it's really difficult to talk about property tax relief or tax relief generally if we don't talk about spending constraint. And levy limits are focused on spending constraint. They establish rollbacks or reductions to ensure that collections don't increase in the aggregate beyond a certain amount. So importantly, with a levy limit, you'll see an individual's tax liability increase or decrease based on, say, a rate or the value, assessed value. But in the aggregate, collections are constrained. These limits are subject to voter override, which we see in many parts of the country. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but they should be uh, a little bit more transparent in most places where you actually, the, tr the voter actually understands what they're voting on. Uh, and they should be a little bit less easy to bring before voters. It seems like in some jurisdictions we see a uh, voted levy every cycle, and that can be problematic. Uh, for a number of reasons, and it becomes uh, really less transparent when the, the wording on the ballot is uh, relatively unclear as to what's actually being voted for. So we think that these are not necessarily a bad thing, but there's policies that can be put in place to do that. One of the things that is helpful uh, in these voted le levies is to have a truth in taxation law, the idea that you're, you truly understand what you are voting for as a taxpayer. It, 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 it establishes accountability uh, for local governments, it uh, informs voters and it shows them what could be their tax bill had a levy uh, been in place or a levy limit, in fact, been in place. Some features of a levy limit um, that they incorporate, they account for taxation and say another growth factor. 
uh, they typically, well, when well struck, uh, when well structured, they typically exclude new property placed into service, and that that makes sense if you are in a neighborhood that say adds a neighborhood, maybe not, but a larger uh, area that say adds a thousand homes. Uh, that's clearly a, a strain on the local services, and we need to account for that. And using the existing property tax uh, base is probably not the most appropriate uh, way to do that. We. Um, we do look at the, the valuation uh, as the baseline, so it's sort of a float that um, we, we use assessed value as the valuation. And some really good models to look at for um, for levy limits are New York and Massachusetts. And I'm happy to provide a little bit more detailed work on that if, if the committee's uh, interested at a later date. Importantly, if you a well-structured levy limit should not have a downward ratchet. Now, when I say downward ratchet, I mean um, very clearly, uh, that if you are not allowed to grow past a set amount each year and you have a fall in the value of property taxes, sorry, the value, the fall in the value of property, it would be really difficult to catch up later and it could really hurt and strain local services. So uh, anytime you restrict the amount of growth, it's important to clarify what growth that is. Is it What's the baseline? Is it last year? Is it year over year? Is it against a previous high in terms of collections? Uh, if you, if they, these aren't really specified, you could have a situation where property values plummet. And if it, say, uh, requires that, you know, it's, it's uh, compared to, say, last year, it could take a number of years for you to catch up and fund local government effectively. And that's just a really important uh, thing to keep in mind when thinking about, about these issues. Uh, you know, I did talk about uh, truth and taxation earlier. I think there Combining a levy limit with a truth and taxation uh, provision is really helpful. Again, um, it doesn't stop voters from, from overriding the, uh, the levy limit. In fact, very often voters do override the levy limit. But if it's transparent, if it's less easy to, to convince a voter to do that, uh, it does temper local government ability to ask or at least make a better case to the voter. And that's an important feature of a truth and taxation law. So a number of states that I work in have, are considering eliminating the proper tax entirely, just wiping it off the off the off the map. Uh, Florida has a proposal in the legislature to study the matter, so it's not necessarily a, a formal proposal to eliminate, but a proposal to study eliminating the property tax. Nebraska has what's known as EPIC, uh, which is the elimination of all property, all income, individual, corporate, including the inheritance tax. Uh, and replace all tax uh, taxes with a consumption tax at the state level, in addition to a uh, whatever uh, current excise taxes the state levies against, say, insurance or alcohol, tobacco, like that. Uh, local governments in Nebraska under this initiative, um, the EPIC ballot initiative, would also be able to collect a, a consumption tax. Proponents of the EPIC initiative uh, in it, initially, EPIC began as a legislative proposal. It didn't survive as that. And so now proponents are seeking to bring that before voters uh, through a ballot initiative. Proponents suggest it, that a rate of 7.5% of statewide consumption tax, uh, plus, as I, again, plus the excise taxes that the state currently levies, uh, would be sufficient to replace all other revenue. Again, property, individual income, corporate income, and the inheritance tax. We uh, published a paper at the Tax Foundation uh, my colleague Jared Walzak and I did, and our analysis suggests a statewide consumption tax rate would be nearly 22% in order to cover all revenue lost. And I was, that would, a statewide average of nearly 22% um, sales tax would tower over the rest of the country. It would make Nebraska completely uncompetitive, uh, especially in a state where so many people live uh, near the border, you see a tremendous amount of border shopping. Uh, it, it is a potentially, uh, it would potentially reset the many great gains the state has made up to this point in terms of creating a more competitive, more pro-growth uh, tax home. North Dakota, a similar situation, a, a citizen initiative to eliminate the property tax entirely uh, and somewhat reliant on the state's severance taxes. Texas, uh, the governor is committed to using compression, which is uh, what Texas uh, terms is taking state funds to uh, buy down local property rates, pr property millages. Uh, so using compression to eliminate property taxes, but this one is not an immediate uh, rollback uh, and elimination, but it's more over time. Uh, Wyoming, uh, where I used to live, considered uh, raising the statewide sales tax uh, to eliminate the property tax, uh, 
on most homes. Uh, it, would be, it would eliminate the property tax on about uh, 97% of homes, uh, and it would have exempted a million dollars in uh, in uh, in value from the property tax, which is why about 97% of homes would have been exempted. Uh, importantly, Teton County was uh, probably not included in that 97%. Um, so but we see a number of places around the country thinking about eliminating the property taxes, a number of different proposals, often a statewide consumption tax, uh, a, a swap of sorts. Uh, and to many of the comments that have been made, that swap is probably not a one for one uh, in terms of revenue. Uh, and, uh, and the math here is really important to get right. Uh, and so I hope that was somewhat helpful from a, uh, from our Senator, I hope that was what you were looking for. And I'm happy to take questions as they were there. Yeah, no, that was, that was great. Manish. I think that um, points out that uh, Montana is not the only state struggling with property taxes. It's all across <laughs> the country, even states that have uh, the three-legged stool of income sales and property taxes. So um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, Senator McGillivray. Yeah, thanks, Denise. I um, <clears throat> just one question on the Wyoming model. Was that a local option that they were raising the tax sales tax on, or was it just a general sales tax increase? Uh, I believe it was a general sales tax increase um, from four to six percent statewide uh, to sort of cover the to cover the property la tax loss. Now, I think it's important in say a state like Wyoming, where there's a where they do get a significant amount of severance tax. Uh, income. The, the question I always raise is how how long into the future can you count on a stable revenue source there? And that I think is a really important thing for states that are looking to rely on some more on severance taxes, for example, to to fund that uh, elimination. But but to, to answer your point more uh, specifically, sir, it was a general state statewide sales tax. Commissioner Logan, you need to unmute yourself there. Sorry about that. Yeah. Thanks, Manish, for your presentation. I'm assuming you're familiar with our levy limit. It whenever um, levies come up, fifteen ten four twenty comes up a lot. <laughs> and uh, was kind of curious as to, given your uh, broad view nationally, what your assessment is of fifteen brief assessment is of fifteen ten four twenty. I've enjoyed reading that statute. It's a uh, it's been a real um, a real fun one to go through. I think I think that there are ways to to make the levy limit in Montana a little bit more. Um, I think to conform a little bit more with some some better structure. Uh, as I understand fifteen ten four twenty, and I have it a little bit in front of me here. It, it's um it's looking at the sorry so to um. The mill levy is sufficient to generate the amount of taxes, I think, that were actually assessed in the prior year, plus half of the average rate of inflation for the prior three years, if I have that correct. I believe that is somewhat accurate. If you look at, say, New York, um, local government is prohibited from uh, adopting a budget funded by, by the property tax levy uh, that is um, that exceeds the prior year's levy by more than 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less. And I think that if you, I think that the New York levy limit is is cleaner. It is somewhat more understandable, and I think it provides a bright line to local government. I'm not. I I I think that fifteen ten four twenty probably does the same thing, but looking at plus half the rate of inflation for the prior three years, I don't know if that. I'm not an economist. I'll defer to the PhDs on here that are, or um, the members of the budget um, office. But I would say that I don't know if that look back period. Uh, is always a stable source of revenue. Thank you. Um, Manish, do you know how New York, how do they deal with um, new 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 taxable property and, and that type of limitation? Yeah, so as I understand it, typically, uh, like I said, most well-structured uh, property tax levies will exclude new uh, new properties just because they, especially when it's accounting for a certain amount of population growth because just the strain on on local services. And so um, uh, they would exclude that and they would, but they would include the levy limit for existing properties. And then they would sort of go back and look at it for future years. And then I would assume also that voters can override those levy limits. Correct. Any other questions? Seeing none, let's um, to uh, Ralph. Just one comment. 
uh, Manisha's uh, uh, PowerPoint is now online on the website for people as well. And we did receive the materials from Ms. Lewis. Did you did you forward out to us there um, the uh, one hour seminar that's been recorded for the Tax Foundation? Not yet. Okay, yeah. If you could provide that to all the members too, I would encourage you to to um, listen to that. Some good information, um, Mr. Logan. Thank you, Ralph. Could you remind us in the chat maybe of that website, please? Um, I can just say it online. It if you go to the uh, budget.montana.gov that will take you to the budget office's website and then there's a property tax task force link and if you follow that and if you look in the materials calendar materials section each of the meet the materials that we have from each of the meetings are there and please send an email if there, anyone has any trouble finding anything and I can email these things out as well thank you yeah, if you just Google Montana Property Tax Task Force, um, it'll take you to that site, too. Um, all right, um, I'm going to go for some public comment on this topic to see if, uh, if anybody's out there. Um, looks like Mr. Story has his hand raised. Go ahead, um, Mr. Story. I just have a question for Manish about this concept of eliminating property taxes and funding and with the consumption tax, how how you fund local governments that don't have a consumption tax base to tax, you know, how do, how do they operate then? Thank you for that question, sir. That's a great question. And it's actually one that I've had. Um, I, I haven't necessarily seen a good, a, a clear plan of how you appropriately fund uh, local government, just that the funding would be sufficient. Uh, that said, in the case of Nebraska, for example, it would there is an opportunity for local governments to collect that co consumption tax under the plan, but that would just add to the nearly 22% statewide uh, consumption tax. But I have not seen a, a, a direct correlation between how the consumption tax is being collected and then distributed throughout the throughout the state. That's always been a concern in Montana, of, even with the statewide sales tax to reduce property taxes as you're still going to collect most of the revenue in the seven urban areas, and and you've got the whole rest of northern, eastern, a lot of western Montana that, you know, I think the only way you spread that money is through the school funding system because of the required funding of, of those, and that's where most of the property tax burden is anyway, but it interesting concept when you have to depend on again the state government to fund local services with that historic antagonism that's always there anyway but thank you thank you um it's any i don't see any other further hands raised uh so looks like we can move back to the committee before we wrap up here um any any additional comments or discussion here? Um, did I just get knocked off? You're on still. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I just lost my screen, but it's back. Does anybody have any any comments or further questions for Manish before we move on here? It was nice to have a framework. Thank you very much for that presentation. And you, you gave us a nice framework in that and covered a lot of things quickly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move along. Um, looks like uh, Eric Dale's got some information on some TIFs new to, and newly taxable property. Yeah, Senator Hertz, uh, for the record, Eric Dale with the Montana Department of Revenue. Um, let me share my screen real quick. All right. Um, I was asked recently um, if there's any information on new property for TIF districts and discovered, unfortunately, the department doesn't have a great way to get that number. Um, but I did want to present the data that we do have available. So I did that here on a countywide level for 2015 through 2023. 20, 
Uh, these are tax years. So the first thing that I went and found for the TIFFs that you might be interested in is the total tax increment. Um, so that is basically the total taxable value in the increment minus whatever the base value is. And it's presented here for each county with TIF districts in it um, in any of those years. And I also presented the total taxable value to give you kind of a scale of those numbers as well. Um, but as the question came up, I thought it might be interesting to also look at the newly taxable values for the TIF district areas, if that makes sense. Fundamentally, newly taxable is uh, a function of 15, 10, 4, 20. Since TIFs don't generate their revenue uh, on a sort of budget-based way uh, that the counties do, the, and they aren't subject to 15, 10, 4, 20, the newly taxable value is sort of irrelevant to them. Further, um, the county governments, when they are calculating their newly taxable values, the TIF, the newly taxable from TIF districts isn't incorporated into that amount. So these numbers definitely don't get looked at very often and don't get um, nearly as much scrutiny, but I, I did go to see what uh, they were. Um, so these are the sum of those newly taxable values for the areas that are designated as TIF districts, which I thought was kind of interesting. Again, it's for each county um, from 2015 to 2023. Uh, fundamentally, TIF dis or newly taxable values are calculated on a uh, by class level and then summarized in one number. So I thought it might also be interesting to look at what the newly taxable values were by class. And those numbers are presented here. Um, so we have residential, commercial, pollution control, equipment, et cetera, et cetera, um, on down. And so I broke those numbers out for each of the TIF districts for each of those tax years. Um, as I thought that might be relevant, uh, this information is posted uh, on the website and I believe was included with the material that was sent to you. And uh, that's really all I have, I guess, unless there are questions. Um, I, I figure this could be a data resource that you could use to further other conversations, but I don't have anything to add, I guess, at this point. Does anybody have any questions um, or comments about what's been presented? What I found interesting looking through these, a lot of the growth in the tax increment is residential. Um, particularly in the last year. So TIFs got kind of a pretty big bump um, in their increment due to the high um, appraisals um, increases in, in residential property across the state. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then kind of can drill down into the various counties that um, some of them have really seen growth in maybe business equipment tax or other um, property, excuse me, business equipment property and some other properties where a new business might have been um, encouraged to relocate or expand in that particularly TIF area. So, but uh, I think it's got some good information. So seeing no questions about that, um, Ralph, do you had your hand up there? Yes, I did. Um, one thought when I saw that data, and I think you and I talked about it some as well, the question is the, TIF districts release that tax increment at the end of their existence. And there was some question of whether there was double counting because people have to pay higher mills at the beginning and all that. But Eric sort of pointed out that because it's not part of the budgeting function, we're not, we're not really double counting. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, just to elaborate a little bit. So like the county, for example, when they're calculating their newly taxable values, they wouldn't include any of the increment value or any of the newly taxable value in those areas. However, when the TIF eventually expired, that increment would be included in the newly taxable value in that one year for that um, county and all taxing jurisdictions that had a TIF district within them. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, the only other thing I kind of looked at this chart was, um, you know, we've talked about putting some sideboards on TIFs. Um, one of them that's been discussed over the years in the legislature is capping the size of a um, TIF increment, how large it could be. Uh, it, it looks like for the most part, um, you know, the, they're not running a 
large amount. They're all in that, you know, 5% range, maybe a little less, some a little bit more. Um, Missoula is probably the largest because they have several TIF districts um, within their city that is um, starting to absorb probably more of the um, taxable value of the total jurisdiction. All right, so I think we can move on to the next item, special improvement districts. Uh, I was just going to, let's see if I can find the right screen. That should do it. Okay, that, we really haven't talked about special improvement districts all that much. I know it's a topic of conversation and concern. I rapidly went in and pulled looked at the department's uh, taxes levy report and they try to capture the the non-mill levy revenues as uh, SIDs and fees so there's actually two things in here and then I also looked at the uh, the other smaller jurisdictions the fire and miscellaneous districts and just went in and took a quick peek at how important are they and are they growing faster or slower than property taxes in general? And um, maybe I'll find it there. I think there was a uh, last week tonight episode about SIDs recently. And one of the comments was that in some areas of the country, you might be in as many as five or 10 different special districts and these fees are sort of not part of your they're part of your costs and but they're not I don't know whether anyone's thought about how these are regulated and whether you know we always worry that if we crimp down local jurisdiction expenditure growth through some property tax limitation that people would the jurisdictions would have to resort to these fees. Uh, for now, what this graph shows, other than some noise in the system, about 10% of all the mill levy, the equivalent of 10% of all the mill levy uh, collections are covered, are revenues that are received by jurisdictions that levy, uh, that have SIDs and levy these fees and that that number has been pretty consistent for the last quite a few years. I did put the fire miscellaneous districts on there and they actually also have kept their share of the total revenue. This is based on the taxes actually levied, so as part of the total tax. But as we do know, property taxes in general have uh, grown with inflation and with population growth and with increased demand for services. So right now, this doesn't show that uh, jurisdictions are shifting their costs through SIDs yet. I think if you break this down in smaller jurisdictions, there may be some otherwise, maybe some issues there, but this tells me that statewide, this isn't an issue, which then makes it more of a local issue if there is a problem. And I guess that, and then the next question simply is, do we want to dig into SIDs anymore? And, and for the, you know, so I'll leave it at that. Any questions? So does anybody have any questions or comments on SIDs? Um, this is Cindy Johnson. I just have a comment. Um, Coming from a community that relies heavily on SIDs, I have a uh, residence in the small community of Conrad, and um, it seems like we are never without an SID for streets. Mm -hmm. And the comment was made probably 17 years ago that it was time to renew our SIDs because they were going to expire, not because we needed new streets, mind you, or a curb and gutter, but because they were going to expire. And so um, maybe not in general do SIDs need to be taken a look at, but 
perhaps a limit on what communities can do with them. Yeah, I think you're right, Cindy, and some limitations. We have passed legislation in the past couple of sessions limiting how fast they can grow and making sure that they're not just offloading general fund expenditures into a special district um, and make sure that voters have to approve the growth of those SID. So just the you know local government just can't raise them without some type of voter approval. So the the uh, legislative services division, Tony Henneman and local government, uh, I think one or two interims ago, put together a big compilation of all the SID laws and what they allow for. And the other reason I thought about it, I think it's actually in the uh, the tax fairness committee. Remember, we brought up this issue of whether, am I still sure? Yeah, I am. Good. The issue of when do nonprofits or governmental agencies pay fees to provide things? And uh, the we realize that at least there are street assessments that apply to not-for-profits and things like that. And I just noticed that uh, Commissioner Logan, who probably understands these better than most of us, has his hand up. Yes, Commissioner Logan. Thank you. Yeah, I suppose this is uh, here. I'm mo mostly to blame. I think I brought this subject up in the our first meeting. Um, so as I look at my property tax bill, special districts represent about well, 13% of my most recent bill. So it's, you know, it's a fairly significant um, chunk. It's certainly bigger than the the 95 mil uh, that's being hotly contested throughout the state. And uh, I guess there's a, a couple of difficulties, I think, with it. And maybe someone from staff can just answer a general question that I have and have had for probably 30 years now is what what funds special districts? I'm, I'm not sh quite sure I understand your question there. If it is, well, you see it on your property tax bill. So you obviously get levied for some kind of special district charge. I don't know if it's the the one that I have some knowledge of, uh, very tiny, is the street maintenance district, that there's an assessment for linear foot. And, and so the charges go that way. Presumably, it's supposed to be redirected to street maintenance in that area. I don't know of the city of Helena, we have some outlying areas, whether we cover them through those kinds of things. So I don't know their operations. But, but I think you just, it's targeted. I think you just hit on it. But they're typically funded by what are called assessments, as opposed to taxes, which gets back to your slide a little bit about nonprofits and governmental buildings. Um, so those buildings there, you can't tax, but you can assess. You can you can lay assessments on them, so the distinction becomes pretty important. And I, I guess this is kind of where the technical challenge is: is as you know, efforts to say limit levies or otherwise. There, as somebody I think Chairman Hurt said, uh, there might be a tendency to to start mo creating special districts and. Um, so if they're funded by assessments, of course, you can uh, essentially as levy those assessments against every property in a jurisdiction. But <clears throat> therein lies the rub is the difference between a tax and an assessment. And that my understanding is that a tax is for the general good police, fire, et cetera, that everybody pays into for such services. 
and that an assessment is a, a fee pay, a fee levied or charged for a specific benefit that a property receives. And uh, so if there's a tendency to shift toward these special districts, are they, you know, truly being levying assessments or are they starting to tax? And, and um, there's an attorney general opinion out there that, um, that, you know, basically makes the distinction between the two. And uh, I don't know. I, there, and there's another difficulty with assessments, as far as I can tell. We had it happen here in Helena a few years back with the street maintenance district. Was that in the course of, a, and I've used this example before, in the course of a couple of years, um, street main, maintenance assessments went up 104% for commercial properties and close to 30% on residential. And the, you know, the people paying those assessments had no, there was no vote. It's, I mean, it's just up to the governing body to set the, the rates. And, and so it's, it's kind of a like it or lump it scenario. Uh, I mean, you can show up to public meetings and, and weigh in against it, but, um, uh, but there's no real, um, like a tax, there's no real voter uh, approval or disapproval of it. And so th those are the considerations that I thought about when I broached this subject at the, at the first meeting. And, and it's, you know, it's significant, I think, at least in terms of the, you know, when you write the check. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree. I think maybe some further, even a committee recommendation might be to consider limitations and limits on SIDs. And I don't know, uh, Manish, maybe have, when you look at, when you've looked at limitations and levy limitations across the country, um, what are other jurisdictions and states doing with SIDs? Anything? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't, looked into that specifically but i'm i'm happy to and and i'll and i'm will be happy to report back perfect thank you all right is there any other comments on sids we'll cover that there ralph then we got anything uh, i'm 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 all done all right so even though we ran fairly long on our local option tax, we were kind of pretty much back on somewhat schedule. So um, the date of the next local government, this committee is has not been determined yet. We're gonna meet Monday, um, the entire task force. And look at my calendar here. I think that's one o'clock. Um, yeah, one starts at one o'clock on Monday. So um, at that meeting, we will get a um, basically reports from each of the um, subcommittees as as we move forward. And um, at as with our subcommittee, we need to start narrowing down, um, you know, our possible uh, issues that we want to continue and possibly make a recommendation on. And as to the entire committee and, the, and the, the report, kind of working out on a um, calendar basis. So we're going to meet with the, the entire committee um, Monday. I think we'll have some discussion then as to when subcommittees need to probably start formalizing draft recommendations to push forward. Um, I kind of see that happening maybe um, at, at our May meeting for the um, entire task force and then we can kind of work through some of those um, in June and then hopefully solidify those maybe in July and be ready for our final report in August so um, but as as we've worked through some of our possible recommendations um, I, I just jotted these down and I think uh, Ralph had sent me a, a chart too on 
items that we've kind of looked over, uh, you know, the scale of local non-levy revenues and how they're integrated into budgets. We've had a little bit of discussion there. Um, I'm not sure that's going to lead to anything in particular, um, but then we've also um, a review of considerations on mill levy elections. That's kind of been pushed off to the, um, to the education subcommittee. So they're, they're digging into that more. So that's kind of off of our plate. Our bigger one is mechanisms in controlling property tax growth, 15, 10, 420. Um, and exploring in that Senate Bill 511, which we haven't dug down in deep detail in. And then something also that we just discussed to how does, how do limitations work with SIDs, you know, TIFs, bond limits, uh, things like that. So that's kind of that whole 15, 10, 420 uh, and property tax control growth. Um, it, it's a big issue. It's It's got a lot of moving parts out there. So I'm not quite sure um, where we might even come up with a, with a recommendation. Although Senate Bill 511 is probably a good start. Um, it's something that's been worked through the legislature last session, even though it didn't get very far, but it's something that deserves more comment. Another thing that I'm looking into digging in a little bit more too is Utah has a truth has truth in taxation laws, which seems to be becoming a model um, for many states to looking at. And so I'm going to try to do a little more research on that and then probably bring that back to the committee so we can discuss what Utah is doing with their truth in taxation laws and and how that might impact um, on maybe a 15, 10, 4, 20 um, discussions or you know, an option for that. We did talk about property tax assistance programs and the thresholds, income limitations. So that's probably, I think probably most of us are, um, what a recommendation we could probably move forward to is um, we need to continually to analyze and review these property tax assistance programs, make sure they're moving um, with valuations, um, income limitations. And we did some of that in, in the last legislative session on the PTAP program where we moved um, houses that qualify from 200,000 up to $350,000 um, valuation. And then we moved up the income um, thresholds too. So, um, but I think, so that's something that's uh, on the radar. And I don't recall if those are on autopilot. Um, I don't believe those thresholds are or are not. Uh, might be something we wanna look at and see as, as they grow, as valuations grow, if those things move up too. The income limit is, I think the income limit was tied to a percentage of uh, of the poverty level at, at the national level, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure on that. And I think we index some to house, median house values too. Yeah, I, I believe we do. And then the local maybe Eric, yeah, Maybe Eric knows where those are. Dylan's out, he would know. Okay. Local option sales tax, we just kind of went through that today a little bit. I think we can absorb some of that. And then as we come back, probably for our next meeting in, um, in May, probably something, you know, to kind of decide, is that something we want to move forward with? Does it make sense? Uh, my initial gut reaction is, and you know, the relief it provides, you know, I, I think as one of the um, public members said, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? You know, is it really, how much, how much there can we really get out of it? Um, it's, it's, it looks like it's about a six or seven percent reduction in your property tax bill overall bill, and, and so is that really um, with what what needs to be done out there and some of the complexities is is it really worth it? Um, Ralph and I are also um, going to be talking with some folks from Alaska who have local option tax, and they seem to have found a workaround where they can tax um, e-commerce with a local option tax. So, kind of the you know want want to kind of flesh that out a little bit too. Um, property tax limitations, we discussed that, the, um, you know, Prop 13 California model. So, uh, you know, there's been some bills in the legislature. So I think we need to kind of look at that a little bit more. Is that something that we think needs to uh, be pushed along too? And then um, the other issue too is ways to smooth out the impact of rapid um, assessment growth tying mills maybe to a dollar 
limit instead of just a mill limit um, plus inflation. I think that kind of works into the 1510 for 20 um, topic also. So I think I kind of summarized, you know, where we've been. Um, did I did I miss anything out there? I don't know. Senator McGilver, you got your hand up. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. I would have a question for Manish here. Um, I'm curious what you see out there for any fee, like a public safety fee or whatever you want to call it, or nonprofits that are really revenue generating uh, entities. Yeah, that's a great question, sir. Uh, on the fee front, I, I don't. Uh, we'd see a little bit of some fees being uh, put in place, especially where there may be a, a limit on what you can tax. Uh, so, uh, not not specific necessarily to public service, but there's some fees for say um, just for, for different things other than say a police force. But there's an interesting question on the on the nonprofit front. There are a number of discussions happening that I've been a part of about imposing a tax on on nonprofits that are large, uh, large nonprofits. Um, and and the, the, then the question is, it's not just a, it's, what are you taxing? Is it, are you imposing a sales tax on uh, sort of the, removing the exemption for sales taxes on those, in, on those, which obviously wouldn't apply here. Uh, but there's a number of people having discussions around the nonprofits, especially in the area of say a credit union uh, and, and, and the amount of revenue that the credit unions are generating. Yeah, that was specifically, uh, you hit right on one of my questions, credit unions, uh, which are tax exempt, and then also uh, large revenue generating entities like hospitals. So could you, would it be possible for you to kind of give us some thoughts on what other states may be doing or communities might be doing with regard to the taxes or fees or whatever you want to call it on those entities? Yes, sir. If it's okay with you and, um, and Senator Hertz, I'm happy to add that to my list and report back. Sure. That'd, that'd be great. And then yeah, Senator Hertz, kind of, go ahead. That, I mean, you're right, Senator McGillivray. I mean, I look at just uh, my county here, Lake County, where we, you know, we we shifted from obviously no more sawmills, um, not paying property taxes. Um, we had a dam at one time that was paying $2 million into the per year, no longer there. And our growth is local government, um, the healthcare industry, and here in Lake County, of course, tribal growth, none of those pay property taxes. And, and so they've absorbed other non, they've absorbed property tax payers and their economy has shifted. So I think that, you know, merits some type of look at as to these um, definition of nonprofits and what they're, what they're paying. I mean, especially the fee for services ones, um, you, you know, I look at a nonprofit and a for-profit hospital, there's not a whole lot of distinction between the two of how they operate. So um, I think those are some of the things we need to kind of look at. Also, uh, Senator Hertz, I'm just curious um, what about the smoothing question that we've come up with. Did you include that in your remarks or did I miss that? Yeah, I did at, at the end there. And I think that's probably part of the 1510-420 discussion. All right. I mean, if if 1510-420 um, truly worked the way it should, uh, and assessments, then assessments are just divvying up the tax burden. But as we all know, 15, there's a lot of workarounds on 1510-420 that then the assessment gets impacted on fixed levies, whether it's a 95 mills. A lot of counties have their own fixed mill levies that don't get moved downwards at times, unless that's up to the local government then to make that decision. So there's a lot of NSIDs that we just talked about too, um, you know, as uh, values go up and down too, those assessments unless might go up and down also. So. Okay, just one more question for Manish. And uh, it has to do with uh, the new growth. And when you were talking about new growth, you, you were saying it's excluded, but I look at like a city like Billings when you and that new growth is excluded from the 15, 10, 20 formula. It seems like we're growing at much greater than the rate of inflation because of that new growth. So do you see, I mean, did I misunderstand you that typically that's always excluded or is some people bringing some of that back in? So I think that that's, uh, well, it's a great question and a great observation. I would, I would say 
we haven't seen, at least I haven't seen the level of growth in some areas that we're seeing sort of within the last few years. So that comment on we typically exclude uh, new properties brought into service was really sort of historically, we we haven't seen that level of growth. I do think that needs to be revisited, though, because if you're seeing outsized growth in certain areas uh, and if you're, uh, it, you know, what that looks like from an overall property tax standpoint or just overall services standpoint, I, I do think it needs to be looked at. But um, I did not mean to suggest that it was intended to be excluding all of it, but historically we do exclude it for for reasons of the additional services that need to be provided and therefore the levy shouldn't necessarily apply to the newly uh, the newly in service properties, but it would apply to the previous properties. But I do think it's a good question and I, we might do well to explore that, sir. All right. And Senate Bill 511 does go after that, that new growth. That was the basis of Senate Bill 511 is a percentage of the new growth must be used to reduce property taxes, not just all used to, to grow the budget. So Commissioner Logan. Oh, we lost him. Um, Whoop, sorry. Um, just to unmute, yeah. unmute again. So just wanted to quickly let everyone know that the attorney general opinion that I referenced is in the chat. Um, that was the uh, school district in the state challenging the city of Helena creating a fire service district in the city of Helena. They they considered it a special district. The city of Helena did at the time. The state and the schools took took exception to that and asked for an attorney general opinion. And he basically said, you've created a taxing district and you're taxing exempt properties. So that just want to let you know that's in the chat. And I've copied that. I can email that out. We lose these things from the chat when the okay. meeting's over. Thanks. So, yeah, that'd be helpful, um, Ralph. You can maybe give us get that out. Maybe even a little bit of a summary. Uh, I'm not sure how long that that AG's opinion is. Usually, they're not too lengthy, but uh, might give us a little direction. It's, if we, it's not things. too long at all, actually. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, anybody else have any comments, thoughts before we kind of get wrapped up here? Drop. I would like to mention one thing. I talked to um, Chairman Osmondson, and so Monday's meeting is it's almost preferred that we do this one online, uh, and an email will go out with that. We will be set up in the conference room in the budget office, but it, it will probably be easier to do the meeting remotely. We don't have a whole lot of room in there. It's not as big as the reception room down the hall. Plus, I'm not sure everyone wants to travel that far to come no. here anyway. But so it, in the past, there's been a perception that we'd prefer to have people here for the main meetings, at least for this one. Perhaps okay. not. Maybe when we get into more discussion, it would be better. Yeah, I think as we move forward and we get, obviously, recommendations pushed in from the um, subcommittees, um, I think then the in-person meetings might be a little more valuable. Um, obviously, some people travel distance, um, just doesn't allow that that either, too. So, um, Ralph, if you could, you know, you sent me out that that list of what we've looked at. Um, if, if you could maybe <clears throat> see if there's anything else we need to add on there. I don't think there is, but, and then I'd like to push this out to the entire committee. Um, if you haven't already, because this is kind of what we need to focus on now. What have we looked at? What have we talked about? Um, what type of possible recommendations you think that we might want to move forward? You know, I think we need to be reasonable on these um you know we just need to think about our rules and maybe that that initial paper that we had ralph um i was trying to find it here earlier I've, when we I've, were analyzing you know different recommendations kind of get that out there too because um, okay. really we really need to think about things you know if as we push ideas forward do they really provide some type of significant relief is it really long-term relief um, what's the shifting looked like? Um, so there, there's a lot of different 
different ideas that we're, we're pushing around and, 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 and whether they will actually work or not. And, and how long will they, how long will they provide some type of relief for going forward? So if you haven't had time to, you might, um, the presentation yesterday that the tax fairness committee on their homestead Comstead um, proposal was a really a great um, meeting. Um, the first hour and a half of that meeting, you can just go watch it. It'll go through all the different, I'm not sure how detail that committee will get in on Monday on, on that that proposal, but I think that's probably got some, that probably would rank at least to me, looking at all the different proposals from all the subcommittees, that's, that seems to be ranking to me, at least one of the higher proposals that we can look at and would provide significant property tax relief to um, Montana residents. But keep in mind, it's just another shift mechanism too, that yeah, we can provide relief for Montana residents, but that's gonna come to non-residents and second homeowners and and sometimes commercial individuals paying more taxes so we can collect those and and keep the local governments and schools whole while reducing um you know the burden on 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 residential taxpayers so um pretty much what we got with just about everything unless we find a new revenue source like we have talked about today on uh, local option tax but that's also a shift too as i think manish pointed out um whether you just i'm you know i'm paying a sales tax now my property tax went down and senator mcgillivray pointed out too i mean what's the offset is that am i just putting money taking money out of one of my pockets and putting it in the other pocket um although a lot of times uh, those type of taxes uh they're hidden. People don't pay much attention to them. But as Manish pointed out, property taxes are right there in your face. Um, you can see most people know what their property tax bill, but they can't tell you how much they pay in sales tax. And they can't even tell you how much their income tax bill was. All they know, did I pay or did I get a refund? That's pretty much where most people are at when it comes to income taxes, too. Other than those people who actually pay on a quarterly basis for income tax, most of those people can tell you how much tax they pay every year, but um, withholding taxes are pretty well hidden from, from the eye. So um, do I need to, do we need to go over anything else there, Ralph? I don't have anything else on the list. Let me, can I ask you one question about what you would like me to, can I send out that one page I sent you with the, uh, the criteria that the, yes, the council came out. Is that what you were expecting? Just those two pages and send them out. Yeah. Everyone be great. great. Yeah. And then, and then um, go ahead. And then if, they, if I would get any feedback, if we've missed something or you want to add something, that would be helpful. And I okay. can together. Yeah. Um, right. Um, other than that, we'll have our meeting on Monday. And then as we progress, um, when our next full committee meeting will be sometime in May, then we can kind of figure out where we can squeeze in. Um, a meeting or two for our committee here as we try to narrow down our discussions as to where we wanna move forward on. And we may have some new proposals on uh, the truth in taxation. Uh, wanna dig into that a little bit more, the Utah model. So we'll need to bring that back and then probably um, what's going on up in Alaska on their their local option tax as to what how they might be pulling in e-commerce on that if they are. So. All right, before we um, head out, anybody else have any comments? Um, Senator McGilvery, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was reading Article 8, and it's Section uh, 5C, and it's uh, talking about property tax exemptions, and it says other classes of property. And I'm just curious, anybody can tell us, you know, obviously the A and B list out a whole bunch of them, about other classes of property that we may not be clear about other than hospitals, credit unions, and things like that, that are getting exemptions. So other classes, I mean, we've exempted other things like pollution control equipment in the state. Um, you know, recently the bill that I passed exempted um, new manufacturing equipment from a portion of the business equipment tax as it's phased in over a 10-year period. So there's been other exemptions. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Right. Like I'd, I'd be curious to see a list of all the properties that are exempt just to 
have it all in front of me in one page that you can maybe you look at nine out, maybe there's 15 of them, I don't know. You look at one of those 15 and say, hmm, I don't really think that should be exempt. Or um, maybe there should be some yeah. kind of fee on that. I see our excellent staffer, Megan Moore, got her hand up and I think Megan may already have that compiled. Megan, go ahead and... Uh... Hi, Mr. Chair, Senator McGover. Yes, I do have a list of all the exemptions that I presented to Revenue Interim Committee as well as uh, their estimated cost for, I think, 10 years. Yeah, I would appreciate you uh, sending that to me, committee, if you would. Put that in the chat. Yeah, if you could yeah, push that out maybe to um, Ralph and um, email and I'll send it out. Send her out. Also, and uh, Mr. Bott has his hand up and I'll let him go. And then I have one other source of information for that. All right, Manish, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, on, the, on the Alaska issue, I apologize if I'm missing something or if I uh, failed to speak up earlier, but this, the state obviously doesn't have a statewide sales tax, but the, the has collected or has required marketplace facilitators and remote sellers to collect at the local level. That's been hugely problematic. And the question of compliance is always a, an yeah. issue. There, I believe there's a bill now to, to for a statewide sales tax specifically aimed at marketplace facilitators. That would be a 2% statewide tax uh, on $100,000 of gross sales or 200 more transactions. Um, I believe that's in the legislature now in Alaska. Where are we at with that on, um, I mean, the federal government has a tax related to internet sales, don't they? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. And, and there's a whenever there's a lack of centralization of the collection or remittance, it's just, it's quite burdensome on the actual uh, taxpayer. Uh, not That's not to say a larger marketplace facilitator couldn't absorb that, but for the smaller ones, it, it does become quite onerous from a compliance standpoint. So, Yeah, I think that was brought out at the local option tax. Uh, our resort taxes aren't as bad because most of our resort communities are fairly small, but I mean, yeah, you, you bring a local option tax into a large city like Billings or Missoula, um, no centrally collection center, it, it, it becomes difficult. I'm not sure if they've thought that, walked that all the way through. All right, so I guess I don't see anybody else's hands up. So thank you everyone today. It was a, I think we got a lot of good information today, um, worked through some things. Sorry for the extra length here, but um, looking forward to, um, listening to the entire committee on Monday and getting some reports. So see everybody. Thank you. Thank you.